this is going to be another episode of Summoning Insight. The only thing is, though, what I want to know at the beginning of this episode is what actually is the point of this episode? Like, is it just essentially <laughs> another update week by week? Because there's nothing momentous actually happening. It's like one of the only weeks ever I can think of where if there isn't even anything approaching drama. I mean, to be fair, it, this might imply something about the current like fan base of the LEC that like in their down week, just all nice and quiet. It's like, what's going on, on the Western Front? <laughs> nothing. It's just... A, <laughs> <laughs> tumbleweed going by like it's no drama at all what's going on even the lck everything's quite quiet nothing nothing crazy going on what's what's going on in league is it died <laughs> uh, uh well well thorin you say there's no crazy drama so but we get did Dom to say something mad come on we need, to, we need to get something going come on guys come on what's going on yeah it, it's it's crazy thorin sometimes you know oh, it's weird it was, there was something wasn't there wasn't there like layoffs or something wasn't that, like, was it wasn't <laughs> Wasn't it something like that? Uh, there was layoffs at ESL Face It Group, but I'm not sure oh, that's, that's going yes, to true. affect uh, League of Legends. Um, it definitely might affect some of the Counter Strike or what other esports stuff. On. All right. Uh, well, I mean, first off, it has to be said that it's it's is it a coincidence that we only have gameplay to talk about on the weeks where only the Asian leagues were running, Thor, and it's just mysteriously absent of stupid right. drama. <laughs> Uh, but secondly, we did actually have a, a DDoS scandal over at the LCK and they actually, so I, I had heard like the, the whispers of it being a DDoS attack that had targeted the LCK studio, making it so it took basically guys, if you don't know, there was a match between D plus and DRX that was supposed to start at 3 PM Korean time. I believe it ended at 9.30 or 10 p.m. So oh, with the DDoSing, hell. they literally had so just something like... Like seven hours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the foot, the play, that's inhuman to the players. You should be allowed to just go home after about two hours. Like seven hours just sat there waiting to play the game. That's mental, man. What? Well, it, it was like, you know, they got like 20 minutes into game number that's one outrageous. or 25 minutes. And then they had oh, to pause it. Hell. Right before the game ended, then, then then it was like a, a two hours of pause, and then the game ended three minutes later, and then they got into game two. And of course, it was a three-game series, so it just kept pausing, and then the pause would just go for like an hour, two hours, and then they would oh, get back into yeah. the game. And so they actually had to postpone the second Guangdong Brian match. This is the thing. Like, Monty, obviously, we know they do that rule in League where you have to not let people talk during pauses. Like, at some point, <laughs> that should actually be considered, like, mental torture. Because, like, let's well, face it, you know, in prison, like, they put you in solitary to, like, punish you by not giving you human contact. Like, you just sit in for hours at a time. It's just well, not able to talk to anyone. Like, don't talk. You're a prisoner of your own mind. Like, yeah. I'm it's so... <laughs> obviously like our job as well you know? <laughs> obviously i just gave up on watching it live thorn yeah, i just gave up <laughs> I just left <laughs> uh usually i have to watch sunday sunday nights uh are my time in korea are the only times i watch live because I, I have to get ready for the monty and wolf show in the morning and eventually i was like Fuck it. I'm just going to go spend time with my family. This is stupid. You could have left and watched like the theatrical full trilogy of Lord of the Rings. Not the extended <laughs> one, obviously. But you could watch like, the original. Like, I'm sure there were only two hours each. Like, get the whole thing watched. That's too much. You can't have a fucking hobbit start in a hall and then put the ring into Mount Doom and the game has ended between two dog shit fucking teams in the LCK. Well, I guess the deep one's all right, but... Oh, you know. well, and, and the... they... It's not even a fucking game either. Just some garbage game like right? well, six hours for. And, and of course, we had to wait for the banger that was going to be Kwangdong uh, versus Brian, which of course then Kwangdong yeah, lost. So true. they postponed that match, Thorin. So they at least didn't make the other players. But I will say one of the funnier things is there, was an, that, is there an implication as to why someone would DDoS? Though? Like, is it like, like back in CS, it used to be really betting related? Like, the, it might like, be you know, the game related. was going the wrong way, so they wanted to crash it so it wouldn't end or some stupid shit like that. I, I, you know, there were theories that it might be like betting related, but I think it would be hard to fix a match that way like it made sense back in the day when when you were playing online and you could like ddos one team to have them like oh. lose but when you're just ddosing the studio it's like both teams can't play the game so what, what are you accomplishing you know maybe there's some like prop bets there that could be like you know kills or game minutes or some way you thought you could disrupt it to make the game sloppier potentially right but i think that's kind of a long shot so if i had to guess i think this one was just for the for the fuck of it you know like i i don't know um 
there there has been a pattern in Korea with uh, pro players getting DDoS or their games getting DDoS because people wager on the, the the matches on the live server that you can like watch on OPGG if you track the pro players. So sometimes like if a pro player has been in a game, as I understand it, sometimes their their uh, allies like their teammates will get DDoS to try and get them to lose. Um, there's definitely been some shenanigans, and who knows if any of these things are connected, but I actually turned on the T1 game and got very scared because uh, there there, there was a pause within that game. Um, we're in the second match right as we're recording right now, and it looks like, I'm actually looking at it right now, it looks like it was paused again, the first game between T1 and DRX, so it might actually just be straight up happening again. It might just be straight up happening again. So... Um, yeah, it's paused 17 minutes and 47 seconds into with for a ping issue into game number one, and they are all sitting there. I'm watching it right now. <laughs> so you know, the worst thing about that as well is I'll just bring this up to annoy people in the modern day. Is remember the only reason why that match can't just still be played is because we live in an age where even though they're in the same room, they have to connect to the internet to play the fucking game. Whereas, you know what, guys? This is going to actually blow your minds. I know you all think like the past was primitive and had like inferior technology, but we used to have this thing called LAN. And basically, you just had this thing called an Ethernet cable and it went in the back. And you don't even need the internet, believe it or not, Monty. You just have a bunch of PCs next to each other and you connect to that and you can just play the game. In. And actually, no one could need us unless they connect to your LAN. So, but that's ancient technology. That doesn't exist now, guys. So, that's a, uh, we can't go back to the moon. You can't so, go back so I actually, I think I know the reason why Riot does this, which is quite interesting. Uh, so effectively, guys, um, Basically, the way this works is there is a tournament realm that you download a tournament client for, and you do have to connect to the internet because the server, the tournament yeah. server, is not on site, right? At least it's not on site in Korea. In Los Angeles, oh, it is in the true, Riot yes. HQ because they true. don't want ping to Chicago, okay? Oh, but true, in yeah. Seoul, because you have five ping to the server if you're living in Seoul anyway— um, I think it's I, my guess is that the, the tournament realm is in the same spot that the regular Korean server is um, within the riot offices or some data center. You know what I mean? Um, so I think what happens is they actually need that because there isn't an on site server and riot does have on site servers. But you may be asking, well, why why don't they have on site servers within the, the Lowell Park Arena? When oh. I was casting League of Legends, they would have on-site servers, especially for Worlds or, or MSI in these tournaments, because they had to have low ping and they were moving around to various countries or within the United States or whatever, right? So they always had to have one on-site. But it's a huge additional expense for them because when they have an on-site tournament realm at a venue, it has to have 24-7 security. So there is literally security guards sitting outside of a locked room that contains the tournament realm, or at least that's how it worked when when I was casting. And the reason they do this is, is because if every, anybody gets a hold of one of these tournament realm servers, they get the source code of League of Legends, which also hilariously was already leaked uh, last year, oh, sure. a couple years sure, ago, yeah. last year, a couple years ago. Um, some hackers got a hold of the source code of League of Legends and tried to uh, ransom Riot with it. So that's actually already happened, but they... It's because, it, at least back in the day, they wanted to, um, they wanted to protect the actual source code of the game, and so I think the reason why it isn't, it isn't. It's they're site. treating it like it's some sort of like they're they're treating it like it's not even just a game, like it's actually some shout of like fucking. Like some like Dune artifact or something has to be transported like carefully. Like, watch out, be careful. It's the fucking riot <laughs> server. Watch out. Oh, oh my God. Only four people can see it. And then two of them have to be killed afterwards. So the secret will be kept safe. Like, give me a fucking break. Yep. Well, I mean, it's made them billions of dollars. So what True. what can you say? True. What can you say, Thorin? Uh, their, their paranoia may be justified in certain ways. Uh, at least these pauses are going to be good potentially for, for our viewership, because I imagine people will just start filtering over here that the, that the longer and longer this LCK pause goes on as they wait for the its interminable conclusion. Um, but hopefully, guys, it actually ends at some point tonight and doesn't go into the AM. Uh, because I don't like staying up super late watching these League of Legends games, but I do love 
into the AM's clothing. Right, Thorin? I'm actually wearing one of their unbranded shirts right now. Um, they offer great menswear, including even like button-ups, flannels, polos, Henleys, graphic t-shirts, regular t-shirts, joggers, athletic shorts, beanies. Like their apparel line is enormous, guys, and they've been a good partner to us so far. And on top of our normal discount code, which you can go to into the EAM.com slash Elephan to activate, uh, you will get 10% off from that. But starting on February 29th, they will have a leap year flash sale from February 29th through March 3rd, where you can get up to 80% off of various items on their site, plus an additional 10% off using the the link into the am.com slash LFN. So huge savings, guys, this weekend. If you have been looking to try it out, they do offer free, sh uh, free shipping to a variety of countries all over the world. So check their shipping information, uh, places in Europe, uh, obviously North America. Um, and you can get shipping and pay for it to basically anywhere. Um, so it's something that will be available to everybody. Their distribution is quite good. So if you guys have been looking for some good menswear, we recommend Into the Am. You've been enjoying it, Thorne? Yeah, I actually think they're pretty nice. Quite soft, like cotton jobs. So I like it, yeah. Yep. So thank you very much. And be sure to hit their leap year flash sale starting February 29th through March 3rd. Um, so, yeah, I look, I, I don't know what's going on with the DDoS attacks. Uh, they, you know, hilariously, Thor, and I saw right before this match, they released a new statement. Um, Hold on. <laughs> so I saw it like an hour ago. Hold on. Let me pull it up. What could they possibly be explaining at this point in time? What's happening? <laughs> what, what can you do? Well, it was it, like hilariously, it, like it was a, before the DDoS happened. Movie. So one hour ago, Thorin, they said, the LCK would like to extend our sincere apologies once again to our fans, team officials, and viewers who were inconvenienced due to the DDoS attack incident on February 25th. We acknowledge that our inadequate response caused significant disruption to the ticket holders of the second match. We understand that the audience patiently waited until late hours to watch the match, only to experience confusion with a sudden decision to postpone oh, the match. Hell. We apologize. I didn't even thought of that. Think about how long the audience was waiting there. What the fuck are they doing yeah. for hours and hours and hours? Mate? Holy shit. We, we apologize once again for this. During the two league rest days following the DDoS attacks, the LCK conducted network inspections and prepared various response measures. We are diligently researching and imp implementing the best possible measures to ensure that LCK fans can enjoy a pleasant environment for viewing. Although our prepared response protocols may successfully deter the DDoS attempts, it is anticipated that perpetrators of these attacks may try other approaches. In the event of such occurrences, to minimize inconvenience felt by our fans and viewers who have visited the venue or tuned in on February 25th, we would like to present the following response protocols to seek your understanding. In the case of significant chance of game cancellation due to DDoS attacks, we will ensure prompt communication to fans, refund measures if the interruption prevents viewing the full match, oh, no. if deemed possible to finish ongoing game through discussions with teams despite network, network instability issues, complete the game in progress, prompt communication if back-to-back -back matches scheduled on the same day are impacted by DDoS occurrences. And I would guess it's happening again. Oh, yes, it is. They're still paused. <laughs> Oh, no, what's hilarious is someone even put a link. It's actually on Reddit. You can go find it. It says, like, Wolf curses the broadcast. It's amazing, mate. During this T1 versus, like, Fear X game, Wolf goes, well, seems to be okay for now. And then 10 <laughs> seconds later or something, right, the game just goes into that gray, like, loading, loading. Like, <laughs> he's actually just wrecked it completely. Classic. Classic <laughs> Fanta. By the way, I even take it as implied, like read between the lines on that statement, that they're even implying that, like, I'm sure teams of HR, like, how many hours are we going to be here? We can't just be, like, 12 hours straight playing. Like, we have to be allowed to go home at some point. Because, like it says there, like, if that happens on, like, game one, you should probably just call the series and come back another day or something, you know. You can't make people wait f four hours. Think how bad the performance level is going to be at that point in time. And, like I say, the audience, like, where is this new studio now, Monty? At least in the old one in that mall, you could have gone and got food or something. Like, is, it, is this one actually even yeah, it's like, like, next to it, stuff? Oh, yeah. It's right in the middle of the city. It's actually very close to oh, um, right. okay. like the Gyeongbokgung Palace and City Hall. Um, it's oh, like, right. It's, Fair enough. It's yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's very much right in the middle of everything. There's, there's tons of stuff All around right. there. 
So, uh, but depressing that we still have to deal with this. Like you said, it's crazy because you used to just be able to host games locally within yeah, a client. Of course. And It'd like, be played that, immediately. <laughs> and now that's uh, that's no longer possible due to the way that Riot operates League of Legends. So I do wonder. At least that way you could just like play the game in real time, record it, and then just play it whenever, like you know, the, they stop DDoS in the broadcast or whatever, right? Well, you also, I think, could in theory just not even have the player PCs hooked up to the internet because you could yeah. use um, you could use NDI um, broadcasting. I think in order to in order to not even have the PCs connected to the internet, you have them connected to the tournament realm server and then you use NDI to connect the you know to get video feeds from the observers. Um the observer PCs. Oh. So it might it may even be possible just not even to have an active internet connection while the matches are occurring and you just kind of plug it in in order to do uh tournament realm updates. So, <laughs> but that doesn't exist right now. And I think it's because they're afraid that copies of the game would be stored in a potentially less secure location. Uh, and obviously the more copies you have of the game that could be stolen, your odds of them, in fact, being stolen go up. So we'll see what they do. But I, I, it doesn't seem like the DDoSers are going to stop <laughs> as long as they keep having this success. And whatever they did over the past couple of days, because you have to remember this happened on Sunday, guys, and then Monday and Tuesday, there were no LCK games. So this is actually the first day back since the last DDoS attack, and it appears that it's happening again. Um, we haven't, they haven't made an announcement. It hasn't been verified yet, but it looks to me very similar, and they've already admitted that the issues are related to ping. Thing is, that's not that cool a story, though. We need it to be like that. Someone releases their demands. Like, this is the KT fans. Until matters improve in KT, we will be DDoSing LCK. There will be no LCK for everyone unless we can have LCK. It, you know, it really it really is just the, the latest iteration of the trucks. Now we've actually moved to pure gameplay disruption because the trucks weren't actually getting through. Uh, do you want to talk about KT Rolster and their fraudulency oh, in this past week? The worst thing is, every time you're about to start believing is when they have to break your heart, Monty. They never just do it straight up and just be bad the whole time. They always have to have, like, one game woven in there every now and then to make you believe that's possible. I, I mean, it, it's out. The, it's just the way that other teams play into them as well. Like, of course, this week had to be the week that Zeka decided to play a champion that he could actually play again. Of course, he couldn't just go back to Corky and start dropping a, a game or two or even the entire series to KT. Of course, this is the week that Pioshik had to go back to underperforming and he wasn't the same god that he had been the last couple of weeks, especially in those early game plays. They got absolutely just blown out by T1 in the least compelling well, the telecom war about, that we've seen in a the while. The worst thing about the fact that Pioshik gets to play for KT is that literally was Score's team. So you've <laughs> taken the bombiest Korean jungler to ever win Worlds and put him on the team of the best Korean jungler to never win Worlds. <laughs> like, that's also just an affront to like, what it means to be in KT Rolster as well. <laughs> Like, in KT Rolster, you're supposed to be the best and not win, not be a fucking bomb and somehow inexplicably win. And what's <laughs> sad is, like, this is how bad Pioshik is. He actually makes Beryl just look good, mate. That's, it's just true. Like, compared <laughs> to him, Beryl's actually pretty good now. He's not bad. Like, I mean, Beryl's, I Beryl's, having, Beryl's having a, a yeah. decent season uh, yes. compared, to, compared to last year, at the very least, where he was And he's uh, always working on the dark poor. tech, so he's always got something <laughs> interesting he's cooking away with, isn't he? Um, yeah, I, look, I, I wish I, I wish I had been wrong, Thorin, about KT being super fraudulent and their form being somewhat suspicious and likely to kind of take a dive at some point in time, because this series was, you know, both the Hanma and the T1 series just put T1, or KT exactly back to where we thought they would be, which is like a fourth or fifth place team in this league they have the talent to kind of boost themselves up just enough but 
in the end, I don't think they can actually overcome the likes of T1, Hanwha, or Genji. I mean, the worst thing right now is, this is why actually, I guess the most interesting framing really for me is this. Like, Gen G's done nothing really wrong. They had the odd game where they come close to losing, but actually the fact that they almost never do lose even those games is a pretty good sign. The obvious question is this, Monty. It actually does look like, for some reason, like, fuck Dade or Zhao Hubei. These guys, T1 needs to be called, like, the King of Spring because it's always in spring in the regular split that they do this where they actually get, like, a style that looks like, fuck, like, how do you even beat that? Like, that's... That's the worst thing. Like, Genji has the players to do it. But aside from that, there's no team. Like, none of the others, mate. Hanwha, KT, for, forget D-plus and the others. Like, how, how are any of these teams in the playoffs going to beat T1? Like, none of them look like they're even capable of doing it, man. I, I look, I think this, this is, is too the, good right now. This is the classic. Even Fake is cooking, mate. He's, He's actually good. cooking some of these games, <laughs> isn't he? Yeah. I, I, look, we, we had a conversation. You know, Nico is actually disabled on this patch. So that was not a champion that he was going to be able to fall back or rely upon. As far as I've heard it, there are some visual bugs uh, with Nico um, that are preventing her from being played right now. But if you, if you guys have looked at his champion, I mean, he was basically playing. Azir, Oriana, Corky, and Nico. And these are fine champions to pick, especially because they they provide this like very solid foundation to T1 style of play by having a control mage that, you know, scales into big late game poke damage. But for T1, when Nico's disabled, we wondered, hey, what will Faker go to play? And his way looks amazing. Oh, it looks incredibly that, good. Yeah. Uh, his karma him, yeah. looks good. So he's found other champions. And then also, even within the even within the realm of other people selecting champions, you know, the same champions, his Oriana just like straight up looks like the best Oriana in the league. His way looks like the best way in the league right now. He himself is having an extremely good season. And you're right, Thorne. We said this about him last spring as well when we were seeing a lot of the, uh, you know, Gragas games and everything like that that he was pulling out at the time with all of their pick compositions, he looks really good. Um, and he's doing exactly what his team needs to him to do, even if it's not the most diverse in terms of play styles. It works very, very well for T1 because he's just he's dominating lanes on champions By like way, Oriana. And then he's scaling in a huge late game damage. I don't, I don't know if you saw the headline for like this Ashley Kang interview with Faker, where it's like, what I do love about Faker is he does play the part well of being like the Kwisatz Haderach of fucking League of Legends. <laughs> because even though he should just be like, like a really good player, but still just a player playing each day like a pro, like this interview headline is as all like he's had so many years to think about League, like a chess master, like fucking Kasparov or something, that he's like ascended beyond normal <laughs> considerations. And now he's just actually like coming up with like the final fucking theory of everything because this is fucking headline like what's this got to do with the game he goes in the past all i wanted was to win and i was only happy when i had one recently i had this goal i wanted to detach my happiness from winning like actual forget <laughs> he's got like full body sat for that that's right or from winning or, lo or losing we do not have full decision over what happens in the future. But what we can decide is our current mindset. What's <laughs> mad is it's like from first principles playing the game League of Legends. He actually has constructed full like philosophical insights. Like those actually are like deep Buddhist like insights he's come to there. Yeah, sure. Say. And he's also summarized stoicism there essentially. Like <laughs> we cannot control other things. So we can only focus on those things we can control. And from there, our happiness shall spring. Like, yeah, okay, fake. What, what's going on? Like he's playing the game. It's fucking that I like what he says. You've only got three champions. Maybe work on that, not like you know, figuring out life itself. What the fuck? It's so philosophical though. I love it. I mean, I what my, so my, deep. my latest, my favorite, uh, my favorite latest trend, uh, Thorin. The has obvious been... joke as well, Monty, is I just wonder what question Ashley Kang took from her Twitter feed <laughs> that would prompt such an answer. <laughs> What was it like? Faker, please explain life itself. Like, oh, okay, sure, I will. Yeah, what do you say, guys? Most likes, 300 what, likes. What What I love is that Faker released like a reading list uh, recently. Oh, really? <laughs> Holy shit. Come on, I'm going to see this. I'm going to some, I'm some fire on there, though. Is there some fire there? No, you know, I mean, there's, there's like some, there, there's like some, there's, you know, there's some reasonable books. So I guess he, he shared a, like a list of books that he's been reading. One of them was, I remember, like The Selfish Gene. Um, so it, it, some Haruki Murakami. 
So like IQ. Oh, this oh, is pretty good actually. Uh, did you just look at look it up? There's like a, someone's made like a good reads entry of like all the yes. books that he recommended. Apparently, there's like a yeah, yeah. twenty nine of them. Okay. Yeah, so Murakami books. Um, you know, interesting like Schopenhauer. Uh, some psychology. Holy some... shit! Is he? Is he even actually read the book? I often tell people is really good if you don't understand body language, which is the one that's by this ex FBI profiler called "What Everybody Is Saying." It actually makes sense. He would read it though, by the way, because I actually think anyone who's autistic should read books like that because it'll give you like a mad insight into like what you what you're missing out normally if you if you're not keeping your eye out for things like that, you know. Fucking hell, it's got a lot here. I mean, listen, there's a lot of, like, I will say there's a lot of, like, airport books on here, like, The Martian, or <laughs> yeah. like, whatever. But it's all good, you know. He's got, but, yeah, what I like is he's he's mixed in there some subversive shit. He's got, like, Fahrenheit 451. Yep. Okay, all right, faker. I see. I see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, I, you know, I, I find it interesting, but I also, I also just think it's kind of hilarious that people were very interested in, like, what faker was reading, a guy who, who is wonderful at League of Legends, but skipped a lot of perhaps his intellectual development on uh, in order we'll to accomplish League of Legends. There's a lot of fiction in here, you notice. It does seem like he's a little bit of a boring guy. There's not a lot of fiction in here, Monty. There's a little bit, but... Uh, Murakami. I mean, yeah. I, I just appreciate the idea Faker has actually... Re Are you ready for the joke, Monty? This is an old school banger, but no one else is going to get it. So he's actually read a book by someone called Jordan Ellenberg called How Not to Be Wrong. Right. The problem with that, Monty, is that's actually that book was written by Chouster uh, many, many years ago in like, do you know, the meme. Like, I remember that meme where you had that book, like everything I say is right or whatever. You remember the cheap meme of Chouster when he was in CLG? He yes. Used to be so, like, yeah, 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 yeah. With the, and there was that legendary meme of him holding that book up, like why everything I say is right. Was, like That was Chouster's whole fucking MO back in the day. And sadly, I can't even lie, but he low-key based was actually right. Like he did know things about like, like believe it or not, Chouster told me, Monty, in like 2012, some mad insane insight, which is like one of the best quotes of all time in League, which was that League of Legends isn't about like gold or champions or something. It was about like waves and towers or something. It was some like insanely deep like thing that over the years has just reverberated in my mind. It actually was based. <laughs> I, I do find it interesting though that a lot of these players who were playing the game for a long time, because I know Bjergsen was very similar. It's like because they skipped out on school and the kind of rush of playing League of Legends has washed over them at this point in time and they're in their mid-20s, it does feel like they're kind of like seeking a replacement for college in certain ways while continuing to keep up with the game, which is fine. I mean, I, I love the intellectual curiosity of it, but it's... Uh, it's it's curious that this has become such a talking point. Here's the thing, Monty. At least you can take solace in the idea that causes a game league does attract nerds. You at least get people reading like Murakami or something. But like you have to understand, simple, the goat of Counter-Strike is someone who unironically is like, I recommend Naruto. And you're like, you're joking, right? Like the fucking Padme meme or something. You are joking, right, Faker? Like, simple, like, <laughs> no. And I like Hunter X Hunter, like, <laughs> oh, Jesus! It's a, it's a fucking moron, bloody hell! He's only good at the game, bloody hell! Yeah, it's one of those. We've we've got we've got the legends like that, man. That's what our goats are like. I think <laughs> that's probably I think that's probably more normal than uh, Bjergsen or, or is, Faker's but, but reading lists. <laughs> True. <laughs> also, I think. Uh, FBS, which is a is a, a discipline in which you can get by with more pure mechanics, maybe. Oh, of course, yeah. It's, it's harder Obviously, to do that Bjergsen, in mobile um, and RTS. Bjergsen has had a really hard time deconditioning himself because he used to have to read one book over and over and over. It was called Regenetics, and it's a book <laughs> that if you're sent to the highest levels of TSM, and they take like two to three hundred thousand dollars of your salary over the years from contracts off the top, <laughs> then you can access the ultimate level. Where what he does is he teaches you from literally the ground up because he teaches you what boots to use in every matchup. By the way, Monty, I'm gonna actually have to go. I know what I'm gonna do in the future as a gift to the League of Legends community because everyone's thinking that it's kind of over with the TSM narrative, right? There's not even any laughs left to have. There's like seven people left in the company or something. And it's like, we're like, we're, it actually feels like, you know, we're like Hitler in the bunker at this point in time, guys. Like, there's nothing going on, is there? Like, there's, no, there's no good angle. Like, the it's TSM, right. CS2 it, team, or CS2 team's garbage. I don't even know what games they're in, mate. Like, what games, what game are they in at the moment? Like, Fortnite, Apex Legends, or something. It's got to be some shit game, right? So, what I might do is this it's a good idea. I'm going to go back, and you know those stories like Sven told me. I'm going to make like a comp 
compilation of the best Reggie busts into the VOD review room <laughs> stories because some of those are legendary bit. Like, like he actually is telling people stuff like the wrong boots to wear, stuff that's actually based on like shit from like season two, and he's telling people in like 2020, like do this build path. Like, what are you talking about? And he's just busting in because uh, the worst part ever was what Sven said, which is that he said that when you're, oh, I can't remember if it's Sven or Sven Scarer. One of them said that when you would join the team, like an actual cult Monty, Bjergsen and the coach would take you to one side and they'd tell you, look, right, Reginald's going to come in this VOD review room. And when he does, he's going to start saying stuff. And some of it you might not think's right or you might not agree with, but don't ever tell him that he's wrong or disagree with him. Because if you do that, we're going to be here for hours while he's going to argue. And at the end, you're still going to have to say he's right and then he's going to leave. So instead, what you do is just tell him at the beginning, like, Yep, yeah, that, uh, that, okay, I'll do that. Yep, good advice. <laughs> then he just leaves, and then we can get on with the practices. That's what they actually said. It was like, that's like they were conditioning people to join the team, mate. So he was actually literally in an echo chamber where no one could ever say no. And he actually thought he was like the font of all knowledge of league or something. Imagine how good that video could be. The best stories. <laughs> the best of Reggie. I think, I, wasn't it Sven who started arguing with him anyway and then it took three hours and they never yeah. actually... Re- Cause cause that's, I- that's what they were telling me, because like Sven's personality, he is exactly oh, like, yeah. yeah he, can't, he has to like argue over everything yeah of course, of course. So it's, well no it's the also that of all time I, I love this about zven by the way it's not that he has to argue over everything it's that when he knows he's right he's not going to give up <laughs> he's just he's just not going to give up <laughs> so it would be it would be a it, good. <laughs> it would be a permanent argument in that in that circumstance it's, it's so funny um by the way one wonders if this was the environment why Bjergsen wanted to sign a lower contract deal, never test free agency, and then just sign Find a it. new three year deal with them for no reason. This is baffling. I why? wish, I, I wish for, this is one of those times you do wish that like the actual numbers were printed somewhere and what people's salary were. Because the saddest thing is, people don't know that Bjergsen Loki actually fumbled the bag. Like he was there in the best possible years oh, of yeah. NA and he didn't even max it out. Like the joke is, people like Jensen probably made way more if you look at like how many times they moved team money, like how many times they went like team liquid. Like, oh, yeah. And they just kept getting like the biggest deal. Obviously, Hooney must have made fucking loads of money, like double lift. Some of these people fucking balled out, mate. Uh, I I do think that um I do think that Bjorkson probably made the most money in a single year considering he was above two million dollars on Team Liquid, but I think in total oh, sure because he team. lost yeah yeah. But in TSM, he, there's no way he was ever no, in the he, one. No, he think. lost so much money. I it, I mean, po- it's possible that the equity when he sold it, you know, made up for those losses. Like who knows? But just in terms of pure contract value, uh, he definitely did not maximize his earnings uh on tsm because remember the dumbest thing is he didn't even do the faker where like you just let them all talk to you in the off season and they get like the yes. insane offers and then they ha- then they have to put you up of course they have to match you know or do something reasonable i think i think it's crazy that he never i mean i said this at the time it was happening which is like why would this player not at least test free agency he literally just signed a new contract and as far as i could tell from behind the scenes without talking to anybody any other team never actually entered free agency because the first day that free agency started he just signed a new deal a multi-year deal with tsm it was insane it was insane by the way the other thing i also think is whack that i will just say is this is remember the exact time period when he came back from being retired and even the, the time period just when he was about to retire. That was when there was actually finally money in Europe, mate. He could have just come and done like two years in LEC at the end. Wouldn't that have been so sick? Like what if he'd actually be good or if he'd use his like, experience to like be a good playoff player or something? That would be fucking amazing. Or even imagine him actually going to Worlds from Europe with like a real team. Wouldn't that be a I, sick way to end your career? Not just play for fucking shitty 100 thieves. Who cares about that? I wish Bjergsen and Double Lift had both gone to Europe at some point sure. in their career. I think that the results would have been very rewarding. So it's a it's one of those perpetual questions of League of Legends, which is what if these two players did not actually spend I mean, technically it wasn't his entire career for Bjergsen, but basically his entire career. You know, their entire careers within North America. And what if they had been on some of those really competitive European teams when those teams were making much deeper international runs? 
I mean, all, all I'll say to people is this. You don't have to think of them in their prime. Like, look, obviously, if I could, I'd go back and take them from, like, season six and season seven when, like, Jensen was, like, fucking unbelievable in lane and then, like, Bjergsen was, like, probably at his peak. But even at the end, like, if you just think about how people, like, Nuke Duck played at the end of his career, you can just play as, like, a sort of shot-calling captain who just plays, like, go even in mid and then just use your brain, you know? Like, they, like Bjergsen easily could have been on, like, a top team and still done something in Europe. That's why it's so sad he just sort of withered on the vine because actually the other thing is as well, as soon as those players became not the best in the LCS, you know it's the LCS like quality just looked way worse because that was when you had those splits where it's like the best players literally were like unironically like Takui, fucking Bjergsen, but when he's washed, like, no, oh, that was rough when those are the best players, mate. Fucking hell. At least like, the like joke he... is wouldn't... Wouldn't even Parlor Fox have been like one of the best? I don't know that might have been slightly before his time, but yeah, there wasn't even that many. Like, who even was around back then? Was DeMonte even there still? <laughs> no one. Those, those were the, the grim years of, of North were, America where they were all were getting worst. paid absurd sums of money, too. Yep. It's mad, isn't it? That's the weirdest thing, dude. Like, for real, you could actually, you'll like this illusion. You could actually make the obvious illusion that, like, that TL super team that costing seven million is like the fall of the Roman Empire because they're like, they seem like they're one last gasp at being like a great civilization and that just all crumbles <laughs> in on itself. And now we're in like, just, we're just like barbarians picking at the bones of what was once there. And it's all broken down like fucking amphitheaters and stuff. It's like, we lost the tech. It's gone. We've lost it now. Well well, I mean, it, 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 in a way, like I, I will say, and I, I, I made this point on Power Spike as well, but I think that maybe one of the qualities of the LCS that has actually improved is that players legitimately have to really want to go to the LCS and like perform right now. Because, oh, sure, sure. Because now that there's no money to make an easy bag for European players or Korean players to just come over and like semi-retire or sword art to just, you know, run it down. Um you know, the players that are here, people were critical of them, but they seem much more motivated, frankly. And even the bottom team seemed to have a degree of motivation because, as you can see, guys, a lot of the players who had other options, like look at Revenge. He literally just retired instead of coming back to LCS because he wasn't going to get the bag anymore and he may never get onto an LCS team again. So he just was like, I'm just going to go back. And wasn't he the one who was going to become like a doctor or something yeah. like that? I think he had like yeah, yeah. some really insane career. Yeah, he was, for he was, he was in his undergraduate degree in neuroscience and left to become an LCS player. So right. he was just going to go back and complete that. And then obviously that would be a much more potentially satisfying career. It, when you, when you're not, when like, you don't know if you're going to get back into LCS and you also don't know if you do whether there's even going to be money. It makes absolute sense to make this decision. And the players who are going to remain are the ones who really want to be there. And they're not going to be the ones coming over from Europe uh, who are unmotivated or perhaps are just there to collect the massive paychecks and live in Los Angeles, right? So... By the way, that Sword Art one did crack me the fuck up because, like, at the end of their careers, Sword Art and Hooney were just so abusive. It's insane. Because, like, bro, that's so sick that you actually grew up. Like, I don't know about Hooney, but in case of Sword Art, I'm going to go ahead and assume it's possibly grew up in, like, bad circumstances or, like, fucking impoverished or not, in, like, not a great background. But he actually got to live the American dream. <laughs> go, go to America. And like some stolen. 80s some eighties <laughs> cocaine power fantasy. He got to actually run it down in League of Legends <laughs> for millions of dollars. Just fuck off a year early and then just take all the whole bag with him. Like that is so that's like some like legend that should be called like, you know, the fucking whatever, like the Taiwanese robbery or something like that. They should have some <laughs> sick name because it's so good, isn't it? Between that and the fucking Peter Zhang shit, like TSM took some bad blows on the way out, mate. Man, did they take some fucking body blows on the way out. They just deliver a shot right to the... Oh, like, oh that's too good. Uh, uh, he, also, he also completed the American experience of just getting scammed out of a large amount of money you know, not so much that it was actually relevant when he made six million he, or whatever he made. The, the two stories obviously tie together. Imagine being Bjergsen and seeing this motherfucker making all the bag from TSM that should have been yours. Like, that's <laughs> your bag, Bjergsen. And they're just giving it to Sword Art to fuck off because he's so fucking washed at the game. And then even worse, guys, he didn't retire. He just went back to the LPL. He's like, all right. He's, he's not good, but he's just all right. It's like, he, just, he mean, actually's playing again in the LPL. He doesn't care. Thorin. He doesn't give a fuck with it. 
every aspect of that story is hilarious because not only did they lose that insane amount of money on Sword Art, but they also didn't get Double Lift because Reggie got bad oh, yes. at Double Lift. Yeah. <laughs> so, so dumb double, on it, I know. double Lift, he like cut off his nose to spite his face, wasted millions of dollars. <laughs> For no reason. <laughs> got scammed by Peter Zhang, and then the orc died. <laughs> he got scammed by Peter Zhang, then the other Peter ran, and then <laughs> keep going. The maddest thing is as well, that even made Double Lift look so stupid, by the way. Because I, 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 when I had a TikTok account before the Chinese just shut me down with their oppressive anti, you know, fucking whatever, censorship approach, right? But when I, I was going to use like a little clip from his stream, because what's mad is Double Lift has done this thing where he forgets, he like wakes up one day on the certain side of the bed and forgets what he said the other day, right? So even though at the time he thought he could like join TSM again, he'd said all this stuff about how it would be like an honor to play for them. And then within like a year, you're already because of Lena, done all that stuff where he was like, they're a disgrace. Grace, like the way they treat people is just unacceptable. Like, I've never worked for them. It's like, you wanted to be on the team right now, you fuck. Why are you just fake like that? Why are you, why are you turn around and just 180 to change your tune completely? He's so ridiculous. Well, people, man. people just He's ate so it up, though. Nobody even called him out on it. They're like, Yeah, you're right, Double it, Lift. Reggie is a jerk. Remember those like videos? The same that... people have been saying for like 10 years and they're like, Well, you're so bitter. It's like, Oh, yeah, Double Lift, you're right. You're the first person to call out Reggie. Like, that's what it felt like. Oh man, yeah. I, I I don't know. It, the whole the whole saga is just wild, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, good good riddance. I mean, they they keep telling us they're going to be coming back. I thought your Hitler in the bunker analogy is actually quite savvy. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that's exactly uh, you know the Germans were still going to win the war right up until Berlin got invaded by the Red Army, right? I mean, look. I will say the only downside is it would be an even more on the nose sort of analogy if Ava Braun was there as you know she would have been. In, if this was in the past, if we were imagining this scenario. There would be an Ava Braun, but there wasn't in this particular case, so we could have completed. I guess, it I guess the analogy better. just falls apart, though, and I guess it just falls apart. It wasn't go. apt whatsoever. Nobody should draw any conclusions for this. And in some ways, I actually do feel like we shouldn't remove the possibility that this is some sort of like a Marvel Hydra type scenario, because all I'm going to say is technically Lena is out there in Sentinels, which does in very many ways feel like a <laughs> spiritual satellite to TSM in terms of the ethos and the sort of fans they attract. And she's <laughs> off fucking up their revenue. So in some ways, the spirit of TSM lives on. It will never truly be destroyed. <laughs> she's just waiting to be activated. <laughs> some sort of Elseworlds type scenario. Oh, do good. Uh, were there were there any matches this week that that tickled your fancy, Thorin? We talked about K the disappointment of KT a little bit. Uh, we we had LCK going on, even though there weren't a lot of LCK bangers, right? Uh, the, the KT. Oh, like I said, the main story for me is actually just like I said, how good T one looks in general. Like they've done it again, but it's always in the spring for some bizarre reason. I don't know. I, I imagine they must just have like the best approach to coming back from like the fucking break or something like that because they seem to always just get in shape really quickly. That's why I want to see if it keeps going to playoffs though because the problem is now is actually like the most dangerous time to peak in form. Like you still got a few weeks to go. You're not there yet. You got you got to be good in like a month from now. So they've got to still be tops, mate. Look, I think it, at least one would hope that they've overcome some of their finals choking issues by actually winning the world championship uh, and the yips that we used to see some of these players get when it, when they got into the ultimate match of a, a league or, uh, you know, an international event. So that is a po very positive development for them. Um, I'm also impressed with how fast they put it together outside of that Genji loss in week one, because they actually had a pretty I mean, they played literally all of the matches that you could have basically possibly played within the year of League of Legends outside of missing like one or two at MSI. Uh, yes. And then on top of that, they went to that Red Bull event to play the show match. So they had to travel oh, all the G2 way to and France. Yeah, true. So I think they probably took a pretty lengthy pause after that event. And I think they started scribbing relatively late compared to other teams, but their synergy still it looks really good, right? And as long as we're in a meta where and, we can... And Jerry also fucking peaking again in the spring every time, it seems like. That's his fucking time as well. 
Yeah, it's been great. And I think T1, especially with some of the shenanigans that have been happening over in the LPL, uh, definitely looks like the best team in the world right now. Like, you know, BLG took that rather hilarious loss to IG, who, it, it has to be said, you know, not a shabby team themselves. They had a very weak strength of schedule, um, which is why we, we were kind of waiting to see what happened when they started facing off against some of the better teams in the league. Uh, they brought in Leian into the jungle and immediately beat BLG. And it was, you know, what we did see some interesting plays. Uh, maybe not the best series by Jun in particular. <laughs> um, but BLG, I think they, they bounce back relatively quickly against JDG, even though we could argue they should have actually lost that JDG match in game number three. But at the end game state, they also should have won it based on having their 5-0 Darius at the start of that game. And if you guys didn't actually watch game three of JDG versus BLG, it is super funny. So it's definitely worth your time to watch oh, that series overall, because that might actually just be a preview of LPL finals. I think with top faltering a little bit, um, you know, it's it's definitely possible that JDG is actually just straight up the second best team in the LPL at this point in time. Um, and it 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 was very, very entertaining because we saw a Darius get a huge lead. We've seen that with KT um, with or sorry, not with KT, with uh, Gen G with like Keen uh, getting huge, huge leads on Darius into um, the Udyr in the top lane and then translating that into. Uh, very strong carry performances on the map. This time it didn't it didn't necessarily happen that way. Uh, Kanavi made some bad mistakes early and then shut down Darius and fed the shutdown to Ruler. Ruler gets huge on Kaisa and then he gets caught. Then Kanavi then gets caught out and loses the game. So it was the dichotomy. It was the dichotomy of Kanavi. And for those of you who didn't watch a he lot of LP, he has that like fucking Nisky quality, doesn't he? Where like oh. he can be mega, but he also will just give the most egregious like throw attempt you'll ever see. I just mean, look, outrageous. JDG didn't lose a lot last year. When they did lose, it was often Kanavi's fault. <laughs> Dude, I'll never get. I'll, I actually will for real. There's a lot of things I can put behind, but I'll never get over that fucking Belfast game at the end. It was like that was like some wind trading shit. Like, what are you doing, bruh? What are you doing? When he was walked into those sand soldiers, like, fuck it, just let my guy die for no reason. Brilliant. Do <laughs> a tilt. Still thinking about it now. Still, still haven't got over it. <laughs> I mean, it is it is outrageous. But I mean, even in the regular season, we saw this. Like they when when in the very rare matches they would oh, lose sure. a lot of yeah, time. It would be like Kanavi having some like sure. really weird games. Um and he, he did almost save it. Like he he fucked up the game at first, then he saved it, fed ruler the gold, and then immediately just rug pulled his team at the very end and lost the game. So it was fine. By the like, way, you know, you know, there's already enough good memes. I'll never get over how good that unintentional meme was. That famous IG account one about like Jackie Love or whatever, where it was like, oh, or was it like the fucking jungle? I forget. Where it was like the one about this was not a negative gaming experience. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's still one of the greatest memes, like inadvertently of all time. It's so good, isn't it? We've it's confirmed like so well it was written. not a negative gaming experience. <laughs> It's so good. It's so well in the way it's written as well. Like, what dystopian world am I living in right now? Shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brilliant. So I, look, I, I think I think JDG or BLG, maybe a, a couple of hiccups in the past week. It, it was a tough outing for them. Uh, they bounced back versus Thunder Talk. They've got easier matches uh, coming down the pike. Um and we we also have you know some surprising teams that are doing well, uh, particularly Fun Plus Phoenix, which has put together oh, a course, five yeah. and three record and has had what is looking like going to be a very hard week, guys. And that hard week already started with them just beating top esports, which was a pretty big upset. And then they have to play NIP and Weibo. And if they can three zero this week, we have to start talking about this team maybe being like a top four team in the LPL. Like that is. It's pretty crazy that a team that got Dokdam and Life, two the most Korean uninspiring players. Korean reje <laughs> reject bot lane imaginable, isn't it? I don't know. Who gives a fuck about it's that? It's like bot lane? it's like they're good enough to be on a professional team, but they just 
they never really got good. You know, they they just kind of stopped at being mediocre. Like what I hate about it as well is if you think about it though, you can make it sound so much better though. You're like, oh, I've got like a T1 bottle in it and like a fucking, you, you just make it sound sick, don't you? But it's like, yeah, but look who they are though. And the, and the damn one, if you say though, although to be fair, damn one bottle in has never really been the scariest fucking term, but no, it's actually <laughs> mad, mate. Like how is this team? Well, I know it's because the jungler's fucking cracked in it. So that helps. <laughs> that definitely helps. I, I think, I think their entire top side is, it has been actually surprisingly well, performing. For sure, yeah. Like, um, you know, if you look at FBX, you wouldn't think that this their mid laner care would be an uh, you know an outstanding mid laner, um, but I think he he actually has looked quite good. I think he's looked quite good this year, um, and the team is just entirely built around Milky Way, their new jungler, and how he's going to play the game. And it's not a meta where a lot of people uh, in professional play are playing carry junglers. But here, I mean, him and Jun, Jun is also, but Jun's a known like kindred main, right? Um, but he and Jun having some outstanding kindred games. Um, uh, this has been a player that has, and he's, you know, this has been a player who's been really, really surprising. And he's drawing a lot of bands too, which I find to be very interesting. Um, you know, he's getting the Kindred's bands. He's getting the Grave bands, the Grave's bands. So he's also really yeah, affecting some sort of demon or something. Then seems like I mean, people he's, know that he's legit. Yeah, he he really is. He's had you know really pop off games on the Kindred, but it's like people don't even want to let him have these champions that are kind of very fringe meta picks at this point in time. And his team builds around them beautifully. But even his Jin Zhao is like extremely good and definitely carry worthy he's also played you know a number of tank games on Sejuani and Maokai and look good so he does seem to have the versatility that you want from a professional jungler and he draws bands which just opens up picks for the rest of your team right and this has been really one of the core factors to to fun plus phoenix I do think that it, it scares me, Thorin, when I look at some of the games that they've had and seen like Dokdom's really terrible bot lane AD carry twisted fate, because I just wonder how far this team could legitimately go when he's the kappa for you. Yeah, like, well, it's just like the bot lane in general is the cap and it just, sure. you know. I, I, it's impressive he's been able to carry them this far, but it feels like it's going to be difficult for them to maintain this against top teams unless they have some more legitimate carry threats than they than they already have. No, that's the problem you have is remember, like the fucking talent depth of the LPL is crazy. So eventually, you are, something's going to give, and it, like the bot lane just isn't going to be world class, is it? Like think about the fucking bot lanes in the LPL; it's insane. Yeah, and and you also we bangers. We, we also have to point out that even though they did beat top esports, they absolutely should not have won the third game of this series. And if you guys didn't see the end of that game, it is worth your time to watch game three because you will be mind blown how FPX manages to take this game because they literally do a barren for Nexus trade. And you might be thinking to yourself, when did this happen? Like at 43 minutes into the game? It happens in sub 30 minutes. It happens. It happens. The the actual trade happens at in at minute 28. And it is, to be fair, an extremely good call by oh, FBX. Gosh, gangster. Yeah, that to send they they just realized that they were screwed. They had given up Dragon Soul. And so when they see Top Esports kind of going for it they they pick off Zhao Lao Hu who has been killed on Fiora he's 0 and 7 on Fiora this game so they immediately go to Baron but Fun Plus Phoenix is, realizes they can just push down the mid lane they send life to Baron with Maokai just to distract people and to stop recalls and just end the game it it is a it is a very hilarious play um but they should not have won they should not have won this series they should not have won this series. <laughs> and I don't, I just don't know how many more like crazy circumstances they can rely on to beat teams that are kind of just fundamentally better than them. But they are fun. And I would, they, they certainly have upset potential. 
And so if you have not been watching this team, I think FPX is is a squad that is worthy of your time and attention right now because watching Milky Way is, is a real treat. And I hope that this continues because he really looks like a, a player you could build around. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm so shocked that people just skip the LPL every year. It's like, I get the, I get that you don't want to watch every match. Don't do that anyway. But what you do is you watch either the big, big games, like the equivalent is like if you watch the NFL, you watch like the big televised game where they have like the two big teams face off. Or you do this when teams do a little heater, you just check out the players because every year you get a player like this that you've just never heard of. And you're like, who? And they're not just good. They look like actually like fucking world class right out the gates. Or like, think about it. Last year, it was that Leave guy on EDG. Like the, every year, you have some player comes along. By the end, it was the Zika guy on LNG. Like These players just start smurfing. Sick. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can actually get good odds for the upset, Thorin, which is something that you can check out over on Esports Bet. We talked about this on Competitive Edge, which you guys can watch over on the Esports Bet channel uh, more in depth. But I think that one of the really crazy things – um, that you can see is that there is a really good potential for an upset, particularly because we have games like if you look where FBX is at 4.1 odds against NIP. Will they win? Probably not, but worth a flyer for sure, considering they've already taken out top teams and they're at 2.7 versus Weibo. And that actually seems highly winnable. Like the Weibo match in particular seems like that could be a game that that causes like that is an upset in favor of of unblessed phoenix so oh, for sure. um yeah definitely some good some good uh good matches our match of the week guys this week is going to be kt rolster versus d plus kia uh what this means is that if you are on esports bet you can get you can enter yourself for a 20 dollar usdt giveaway and the way you participate is you either sign up using our referral code for a new account below. That'll enter you automatically. Or you comment in the YouTube of Competitive Edge over on the Esports Bet YouTube channel with your username for Esports Bet. Or you place a $10 or more ma uh, bet on our match of the week. All of these will enter you into the raffle. If you place the bet on the match of the week, you can win double, so up to $40 USDT if you guys win. So in spite of getting mega burned last week by KT Thorin, we are in fact... Picking KT again because at 1.8 odds, they are slight favorites, but D plus has been disappointing. Even more disappointing than mids. KT. It's the battle of the mids, mate. Because, <laughs> like, I don't care. Even if you see one of these teams look good, don't ever forget what they truly are because at their heart of hearts, these teams will betray you. They will absolutely let you down. So it's just <laughs> the question is, which one of them sucks more? And unfortunately, this is like how bad it's got for the fucking damn one. It is actually D plus, probably is the, the worst of the two teams. So I think I think this is the right one, mate. This is a good I, bet. I, I think people will be enchanted by some of showmaker's performances and use that to justify potentially having faith in this team. But he is like actual one V nine at certain points in time. And the bot lane has been really bad. Lucid has been a rookie. So he's had some good team fights and good moments, but he also has like egregiously entered some games. Um, and like, you know, their 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 top side really just hasn't been anything to write home about. And I think if you look at KT, in spite of all of their flaws, I would still take Pioshik as a veteran jungle in this situation. I would still rather take Barrel and Deft in this situation. And oh, BDD sure. has been one of he's been the most consistent player on this roster. So for me, it's like they can't even take advantage necessarily of showmakers strength in this upcoming matchup to make a big difference. I don't even know how I can even talk trash on fucking Beryl if I'm not going to just aim all my ire on Kellen. How does this guy keep getting fucking gigs? This guy, <laughs> this is mental. Is he got mind controlled I, him or something? I'm not I, I to get a different player. I don't know, man. Uh, look, <laughs> if he was some sort of laning god, I could maybe sure. understand it. But he is he's like, okay in lane, doesn't actually have the world's deepest champion pool. His pike game was shameful uh, that he played. And then 
We also know that he's basically silent in comms to the degree that he had to get swapped out as an emergency measure at the end of last year for Bible, who was terrible in lane, but who was supposed to bring more shot calling. So what what exactly is his value to this roster? Like, I would have thought they would have just like kept Bible in and just see, have seen where it went, even though the laning kind of went down the tubes, because this just this just isn't it like this just isn't it. <laughs> Both teams also just in such a tough spot because like like do you just keep these rosters the whole year? There's no like there's no chance to make a change or something because well, these are sort of just lackluster rosters too. It's LCK man, so they never make changes. They never make changes True. unless you have some sort of sex scandal where Clid has to be subbed out for Grizzly, right? Like I think that is one of the mo most depressing things about LCK is that it feels like every other league in the world makes adjustments like look at what happened with lng like lng was like cooking scouts mvp they realize they need an upgrade for lp so they go out and they get gala and then all of a sudden like they're super competitive with jdg and uh, among the best teams yeah. in the world that's the kind of thing you would hope would happen but i i've just learned from lck that they are very unlikely to do this it's koreans mate like the korean way is just like practice even harder it's like oh okay <laughs> shit it's like you're not fundamentally actually good enough no no if i if i practice hard and show good games they will cheer for me like some like cargo cult shit again i guess <laughs> I, I mean i don't know if it, it i mean the gming has always been suspect in korea like i you know i don't know what the fuck happened where zeka's just allowed to continue to be in Hanwha after last year. Uh, maybe they tried to get Scout and couldn't, but they to, to build this team and then to say, well, yeah, surely this Gen G core without a strong mid laner is going to do well. It's like you are, it just feels bad because I would love to see Viper on this team with a better oh, mid laner. Sure. I would sure. love to see that. But maybe, maybe, hey, Thorne, maybe, maybe we can hold on hope. Maybe LNG is going to see that Scout has been performing on a very bad individual level within the LPL. And Scout is just, it's just a motivation issue. And if he returns to the LCK and with Hanwa, at that point in time, they would it's actually great. be, you know, potentially like a, a world championship threat, which is pretty crazy to say. Yeah. No, the, uh, that, because here's the sad thing. At that point, it would enable people like Doran and Beano to have more impact on the game. So, yeah, I think it would actually be better. That would be a banger lineup. Look how well I mean, works. also, just having Peanut Scout Synergy makes me would make me very happy because that is a guy who really knows how to play with the jungler. And I love Chovy, and like he was very good at micromanaging Chovy, but Scout has much better kind of like map sense and map intuition than than Chovy does. So I don't know. We're we're probably we're probably just never going to get it. Speaking um, of which, I actually did just release the second part of my interview with Gilius, the oh, legendary trash-talking German jungler of Turkish Origins. And he actually did mention in this interview that the best player he ever clapped in solo queue was Prime Peanut back in the Rocks Tigers days. I assume <laughs> when the kids like a Worlds in Europe or something. Sure, yeah. And here's the thing. What's hilarious is I even said, because it's the obvious question, like when you beat him though, I bet it did feel like you'd won Worlds. And he even said like, yeah, I basically walk, walked around like I was a god. So all you need to imagine is this guy's thing. <laughs> recreate the scene in your mind so think of Gilius. remember though this is in like 2016 so this is age ago so think of some like little hobbity guy just like <laughs> like a little jungler fella <laughs> with the fucking you know maybe fryer talk style hot you know habit or whatever you call like you know not, nothing classy just a little jungler block and then it's him running from an apartment a really like you know mid-tier apartment not very really classy to get a kebab some fucking <laughs> dollar kebab with fries high off the the ecstasy of defeating Prime Peanut back in the Rock Tigers days. And all I'm going to say is now that I know that Prime Peanut was losing solo queue games to Gilius, suddenly I understand why he didn't win Worlds in the Rock Tigers money. I feel like it all makes sense now. He really was the biggest choker ever. Any level of pressure, even fucking Gilius pressure, he buckled into that. What a fucking it, choker. What a, what a holes to down choker. <laughs> it, what, what, there must have been like 2015 when worlds was in, in europe like that. that year yeah. It, like that, been, yeah it must have been something like that that's too funny that's too funny <laughs> love it because what i love about that as well is that really is like the m bison meme isn't it monty because like to peanut he doesn't know that story that was just another tuesday but to gilius it was like no that was the greatest day of my life like, <laughs> of course peanut didn't give a fuck for it, it was you? <laughs> i love it
Of course, Pina was probably also just like testing a new champion or doing something totally off meta. Oh, you know it. You know it. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I think I think the LPL games this last week have been have been pretty fun. Um, but we're we're waiting on the kind of conclusion of FBX is a uh, very difficult week right now. Waiting to see if NIP is in fact legit Thor. And yep. because even though this team They're showing signs, Smith, they're showing a few signs. They they're like tied for first place. They're one game behind Billy Billy, but have the same match score. But their opponents have been so terrible that we don't really even know how good they are. And the one team they lost to was JDG where they got two owed. So we are just waiting because their second half of the, the split is going to be where all of their hard games are. Um, so yeah, especially like the last couple weeks where they have to play like top and, and BLG. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious about NIP. Obviously like the Shanji Aki rookie core is what people were really enticed by uh, when it came to the announcement of this roster at the start of the season. And hopefully they can, they can kind of live up to some of that hype and live up to their current record. By the way, I do think this is actually a flaw in the LPL format, which is if I wanted it like this, best of threes, I would want it to be where your size of the league is like the LCK or the LEC or something like 10 team. Make it reasonable amount. The problem you have in this one is because you have way too many teams, you can only play them each once. And so what you get is like... If you are someone like me who only wants to watch the big matches, you'll just get whole like swathes of the season where you just don't watch a team because they're just playing all the like fucking bottom half teams and there's just garbage games that you're not that interested in. So, it, and, and also it means if you get really unlucky, whereas like think about the LCK, we're all like penciling where like Gen GT1 is. Like if there's only one of those and you get unlucky, it happened a couple of teams at the beginning of the split. If they just play like in the first week, you never feel like you really got that match because both teams aren't powered up. You haven't seen them go through the ups and downs. So so it, it, unfortunately, it does make the actual league not as interesting as it could be. Like the LPLs, too many teams, I think, mate. They should do something like a conference thing or some, some or split it off or something. It's too many teams, mate. Like the bottom ones just they dilute out the quality of the league. Yeah, the bottom teams Even are also good players just, there. Yeah, the bottom teams are just super bad. If this was a ten or a twelve team league, like I think basically yeah. well, all of the matches would be incredibly yeah. compelling to watch because it is a deeper league than LCK because like LCK at any given sure. time, you know, we, we feel good in LCK. If there are six good teams in the league, like I, pr I fucking pray for six good teams. Um, and we can't even get that right now because you know, Quagdung D plus and, and KT have kind of been very quite variable in terms of their form. Uh, but with, with LPL, like, you know, I think teams like, IG, WE, um, Fun Plus Phoenix have been pretty compelling to watch. They're, they're like at the same level of compelling as like Kwangdong is within the LCK, right? Like you see the sparks there and there's something fun or there's a fun narrative or there's a fun player to watch on these teams that really makes you want to tune into these matches. Um, but yeah, the bottom teams are. Uh, are I also trash. think the. Maybe it's also because of how many teams there are. The upset potential is way higher as well. I mean, you already had like the Thunder Talk team had the upset over. You have you always get like a crazy upset for every big team. It feels like. Yeah, I mean, look at IG just randomly coming out of nowhere. Even though, like on paper, sure, IG was like at the top of the standings, but strength of schedule is huge, and nobody expected yeah, them to actually take a two zero over BLG. That was completely unreasonable heading into that match. Um, I also think that due to the number of games Thorin, like, and the fact that teams travel from arena to arena also affects, you know, it increases the odds that those upset, but those upsets actually exist. And also I think, you know, there's enough games that you can easily come back from something like that. So teams probably take each individual game less seriously than they would, um, in some of the other leagues. I mean, you also see this in, in LCK, right? Like, you know, we've already seen some Kwangdong upset, like, you know, of KT or D plus, even though those should be the better teams with more veteran rosters for the most part. Um, there, there are still going to be some of those upsets, but I agree the variance in LPL seems a lot higher, but I think it's also just a product of the players knowing that there's more of a margin for error where you can still like get the necessary buys in the playoffs while dropping a couple. Plus, uh, you know, sometimes you play three best of threes a week in <laughs> the LPL, so it can be quite taxing. It can be quite taxing. Any other leagues you want to talk about? 
I think that covers most of what oh, happened really? in LCK and LPL. And we have L- LEC on break for a couple more weeks. We will be back with uh, with LCS in the coming week. Um, their matches are starting up once again. Oh, I had I had something fun for you, Thorin. Go on. Then. <laughs> I'm sure there was some stuff happened. I'm trying to think of what happened last week. There must be some news. It really, like, actually, not much out- outside of the games. There wasn't, there wasn't too much that was going on. Um, so I have, I have something fun for you. Uh, remember, remember how uh, last spring, uh, there was the hubbub about Easter Sunday, and they had the. They had the LCS finals in 2023 on Easter Sunday for the spring okay. season. Okay. And sacrilegious, the- okay. <laughs> um, so the finals, I where were they played? They were played in North they were played in North Carolina. And like infamously at that time, okay. you got to see that um you got to see that the stadium was like really quite empty for the spring finals last year, because again, like probably, especially when you're hosting an event in the South, probably a lot of people already had plans on Easter Sunday and weren't going to with their families, weren't going to be able to attend potentially a league of legends match. And there was a video with John these jokes, right? Themselves, by the way. So you had, essentially <laughs> you had an area, an enclosed place, like a tomb that was just empty on Easter Sunday when he kept. I mean, it's on point. You know, they keep it thematically <laughs> accurate. You know, the LCS so, is dead. Fair so, enough, okay. <laughs> so Thorin, come on, give me the John um, Needham angle. Come on. So John Needham was like, "Yeah, you know, we made some scheduling mistakes. We had the finals okay. on Easter Sunday." Uh, there, there was some, I think he said something I'm remembering off the top of my head. I think he said something about like, you know, this was when the arena was the arena that we wanted or that we had booked out was going to be available, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So let me walk you through Riot's new chain of logic about spring finals. Do you know when Easter is this year? (laughs) Last week of whatever. Like- <laughs> Last week, it's March 31st. It's Sunday, March 31st. Okay? Okay. So, do you remember what Riot said about where... Oh, so the again. L- Finals is going to be on Sunday. Hold like up. Do you, remember, do you remember where Riot said the Spring Finals would be this year? In the studio, wasn't it? Didn't they say? Uh, yeah, right. Who owns that studio? <laughs> they know. Riot, Riot Games. Episode, Riot hey, Games. Riot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Riot Games. So Riot Games owns that studio. So in theory... But they've managed to fuck up their own schedule is, is the punchline. In theory, Riot Games could schedule the LCS finals. You can do it now. Yeah. You still so ahead in of the, time. In, in yeah. theory, Riot Games could schedule... Now, I will remind you that LCK finals and, L- and LEC finals for spring are both on April 14th. They are two weeks later. Okay, Thorin? So what I'm saying is there is plenty of time before MSI for a final that is happening in the LCS studios in Los Angeles to be scheduled. Do you know when they scheduled finals? <laughs> it's on Easter Sunday. The 31st of March. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Like, that's why you know, like at this point in time, you, the joke is, does John need to actually even decide this? Or is his job just to message it to us? Is his job just to make it look, put some fucking sugar coating on top and then just send it out there? Like, there we go. <laughs> Same thing again. Dude, sorry about that, guys. The third time will be lucky one. <laughs> but I just love how they literally apologized for. So. Not only do they have a two week window, well, uh, where at least two other leagues, I don't, LPL's playoff schedule hasn't been announced yet, but I would imagine LPL will also be playing after March 31st. Oh. Um, I mean, that's a reasonable assumption just based on the number of games that they have left, uh, left to play. But they literally have two possible weeks after Easter Sunday to do an LCS final. They didn't have to book a, be- a venue like they did last year. They apologized last year for doing it on Easter Sunday, and they are doing it again on Easter Sunday. This is also the same season in which they scheduled 
on Super Bowl Sunday and then took a two week break because of Valorant. So like I don't even know what the fuck we're doing anymore with LCS. Like it is it is mind boggling to me that we acknowledged the mistake of doing this last year and then are doing it again when we con- when Riot controls the availability of the studio in Los Angeles and could theoretically move it a week or two back to coincide with some of the other finals that are happening and still leave plenty of time for teams to get to China for this year's MSI. Logically, what Riot will have to do is earlier than expected, activate their trap card and just have Mark Z drink Hemlock <laughs> on stream and then basically for having the crime of, you know, corrupting the youth of the LCS with his <laughs> scheduling witchcraft, then, you know, then we'll move on to the next commissioner. That's what commissioners are for, guys, to take the, the aggro. <laughs> I, I just, I just like, as soon as I realized this today, Thorin, and as soon as I realized it, I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, oh, this is, it. It, how can this be playing out again? When they are in total control of this, it it, it baffles me. It baffles me. <laughs> well, what can you do? Uh, that's what. I, that's that's the only other hilarious piece of news that I have, Thorin. Do you want to do some viewer it's questions? Just mad. Like, like even though I get that you don't make much money nowadays, it's like not a great like business model to do it in a live studio. Surely, just for the prestige, you want to do it though and have it in like a venue with somewhere. Like, surely you have fans in LA. there is a big part of. Like, you want the experience for the players as well. Like, like it actually sucks that thing I told you where someone pointed out that even though Abadagi had been in all these finals in the LCS, it's like they're always in a fucking studio. It's like that. You want to play in a fucking arena eventually and have actual crowd with like fucking doing chants and stuff. You don't want it to be like 200 people every time. That's just whack, isn't it? Like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Obviously, if you're going to do it on Easter Sunday, just send it to Las Vegas. Nobody will be going to church there. <laughs> I, I I think you could do a small road trip here to a, you know, a venue that already has like an AV setup in it uh, and oh, make it at least I, somewhat I compelling. <laughs> I know one thing that I could bring up just because listen, it, look guys, look at the time. We haven't even got two hours done yet. This is like a short episode so far, which is, I just want to know what you thought Monty. Cause I didn't ask this. I, I'm not a obnoxious person guys. I don't reach out to be like, check this out. Look how straight fire this tweet. I've just done it. But what did you think of my unofficial first entry of the memoirs of Jacob Wolf? Did you, oh, I didn't did see, see this. <laughs> oh, wait there a second. I'll, have to find, I'll read it to you. All right, so, you know, you. you can on Twitter, you can do longer tweet. I'll read this yes. out guys. So basically <laughs> This is obviously not real, but it's very, very hurtful and true. So listen to this. It's called <laughs> Call of the Wolf, Memoirs of the Esports Journalist, Chapter 1. <laughs> there I was, receiving a signed first edition copy of the Bible from my close personal friend, Mark Cuban. Mark, <laughs> it's your friendship these last few years during my time being on the ESPN campus that has enabled me to break roster moves nobody thought possible in journalism. That's why they pay me the big bucks. You must be up to what? High five figures now, JW, the humble billionaire <laughs> friend of mine, cautiously inquired as we ate gourmet chili dogs and drank expensive IPAs you probably don't even know about since you're not hooked into the local hipster microbrewery scene. Just cracked six, I said nonchalantly because I'm no braggart. Jesus, he whispered. I could tell he saw me as a young Edward R. Morrow, buoyed up with the passion of Arte S. Thompson. If I'm being honest, and let's face it, I'm not one to indulge myself unduly. I suspect my career intimidated my friend a little. No wonder he had no time to appear on my Visionaries podcast. It's almost <laughs> over, don't worry, guys. Not to worry. This next episode, featuring Nathan Grayson, Jason Shreer, and myself explaining why we're all ethically superior in journalism to the best esports journalists, will bang, as the kids say. (laughs) Not everyone is cut out to be a nine-year veteran in a field as deep as this. A legend, a myth, which reminds me of something my friend TSM Myth, the world-famous streamer, told me after I won the esports journalist of the year award. Dot, dot, dot. That's the end of chapter one, guys. Like, I don't know yet whether there will be a chapter two, whether it, I will switch up. Maybe we'll go a different genre. Maybe we'll have like, I don't know, fucking Mark Merrill's diary entry or something. Maybe we'll, t- we'll switch up the theme. But the point is, 
the pen's out again. And the pen indeed is mightier than Sword Monty. So there you go. <laughs> the thing is, it's a lot of inside baseball there. You have to sort of know some things behind I the mean, scenes. But if you do, it's, you know, it, it it's is pretty good. It's fucking pretty good. hilarious if you know... <laughs> If you know what's going I'll on. I learned him pretty well. I, I got him pretty well. I got him pretty well. I, the, the best part is that he has no sense of humor about himself either. So he's just going to oh, get no. salty about this. I'm just going to get mad. Like, because it is like, it's not that, if it's not that offensive. It's just fucking funny. Not really? And, and like, yeah, it's not really. I'm like, if, you, if people don't know, I'm only lampooning like really reasonable, risable elements of his character. Like the joke is if someone wrote that about me and they did it well, I'd laugh as well. I'd yeah, of course. Got me of course. Of you course. Know. Yeah. Oh God. Oh, that it, yeah, <laughs> the Mark Cuban in the podcast stuff is is my favorite. Oh, oh, no, that was very well done. Of course, of course. <laughs> it's a bit yeah, as fuck, but I don't care anymore, guys. Because so. I just realized as well in the modern day, like since you can do those bag of like super long tweets like that, we can just extend the length of it. Like that's the perfect thing for that bit. Just like esports express done properly, because I've always thought <laughs> satire actually is fucking so poorly done in esports. Usually, isn't it? So I, you know, that's why I always say as well. Here's another thing, Monty. Do you know this is how insanely inverted like consensus on the internet is? Do you know the number one thing people complain about in Counter Strike when Richard does his writing in his like Gonzo style, where it's like you know, it's like he oh, puts yeah. all his own thoughts and funny illusions. They think that part's the shit part, and that he should just like <laughs> stick to reporting the fact. It's like, bro, these people have no fucking taste whatsoever if you don't know guys he's actually really that's this biggest strength you idiots he's actually really good at that style of writing it's like super compelling isn't it and like takes you through the story in a way it's way more interesting like people just have no fucking no taste mate yeah well at least some of us can appreciate it <laughs> i'll have to i'll have to check that out later i actually do want to see the the replies you got I don't think there's anything BM, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so good. But the yes. thing is, I was just thinking to myself, I was doing it just as like a silly joke on, on Jacob. But I also did think you could do so many different people in a city. Like I could do a <laughs> double lift, you know, double lift diary entry as well. There's a million people you could do that would be really good. I look but forward to your... If you nailed all the angles again. <laughs> your Twitter series. <laughs> don't need them, Mark C. There's a million angles we could take Fa for this Fallen, one. Travis, Fallen would be a, a, a massively True. good <laughs> Basically, if anyone fucks with me, I'll just start writing fictionalized diary entries about you. <laughs> seems a bit unreasonable, but I might do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's good. All right. You want to do some viewer questions? Obviously, the joke is I would say I'd do like Slash's diary entry, but it'd be the same every day. It'd be like, woke up, smoked weed. It's still not 2016. <laughs> Back to bed again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the massively hurtful, mean, potentially true statement. Right, viewer questions, then, yeah, we'll do a little break. All right, break, guys, and then we'll be back with some viewer questions in a minute. Right, we're back. Time for the viewer questions. If you don't know one of the other ways you can support us here and get the perk of asking a question to me and Monty is you can subscribe to our Discord. If you do so, there will be a channel within there. You can put your question in. As usual... In theory, you can ask about anything. Just obviously keep it somewhat Twitch appropriate, etc. And don't ask things like, you know, like about some like super third rail political topic or something. Just keep it, keep your dick in your pants on that one. Keep it fun and light, and then we can all go to bed safe, can't we? And then we can have continue to have sponsors and make podcasts exactly. for you guys. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, first question. Valorant has recently released team skin bundles for the 44 VCT teams. The revenue is split 50-50, and the teams even helped design some of the items. Why hasn't something like this not been why hasn't something like this not been done with the 47 major region League of Legends teams? Be Riot says it's impossible, guys. Riot said that it's impossible to actually give well, you know, here's here was the reason they gave. They gave a very riot fake answer, which is that they said, well, we have all of these leagues, including like the Turkish League and like, you know, the the, you know, the Pacific League. And we have the Oceanic League and they didn't just say major regions. So they made it sound like they had like 100 teams that they had to give skims for when when they've been asked this question in the past, which is obviously um, super disingenuous. Uh, sure. um, now. 
one could argue that you should probably be only giving skins to teams that paid you franchise fees to be in the league because those are the teams that you're oh. do, doing the most revenue sharing with, right? So it would make sense uh, that potentially you would sell digital good. So I don't know if the reason is that they can't do chromas or whatever because it, League of Legends spaghetti code or it would take too long for the artists to do this or other artists are incapable of creating League of Legends assets where maybe Valorant was designed in a way where um, they could partner with teams and, and outside artists in order for them to design stuff that then gets approved by Riot. So Riot doesn't have to do all of the designing, you know, now. I think this is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. Like, I think this is awesome for the teams, and I fully support Riot doing this. The Valorant business model is so much better, right? It's so much better. Oh. Um, they, they pay you. They just... Look, I don't like Riot being a, the kingmaker because I think that they are, you know, they are run on the esports side by extremely shitty people. Uh, but it is better for the teams to not have to purchase in to be selected for being good esports teams although you know they did pick eg that was a little weird and they didn't pick optic which was also incredibly weird so there was definitely some hard cronyism going on in the partner oh, team sure. selection uh, uh you know like remember cloud nine didn't even get in until the last possible second too so there was some really like fucking strange shenanigans about the teams that got into VCT partnering, at least on the North American side. And here's an angle for you. Obviously, the whole premise of what they're going to claim, Monty, is that even though obviously it's literally just like a fucking Jedi Council, like we do not grant you the title of fucking master or whatever, even though it's just that, they're always going to pretend that they did an investigation of your finances and they weren't good enough, right? Well, all I'll say is the obvious thing, which is how the fuck did Sentinels get in then? Didn't Wasn't it like one year later, Sentinels was like, we don't have any fucking money, please, please. We need the money from the investors. Like, like you supposedly investigated and saw that this team could like last for years and years, and that's why they could be in your partnership program, right? So I don't know, mate. It's that's the only downside. I know what you mean. Like the problem is inherently you don't want Riot selecting because they will just be shit heels like this and do stuff like exclude you on the basis that they don't like you or someone else doesn't like you. But at the same time, like you do obviously want Riot handling this part and being engaged with selling skins and creating skins yeah, yeah. and making a market for you because like I. I agree. Why isn't this in league? Like the weirdest thing about esports to me, mate, is it's like these t companies actually choose not to make money. Everyone's doing the fry from fucking Futurama meme. Like, please just take my money. I just want to spend <laughs> faker skins. And they're like, only when he wins worlds. Like, Bro, when I grow up, like the most obnoxious thing about American culture, Monty, is it was ubiquitous. Like in England, where no one plays basketball, you'd have Michael Jordan fucking jumpers and toys and figurines and stuff. Like how is, how in this one area where there's all this disposable income, do we not have like a million ways to spend your money and buy as much shit as you want? Like it's actually mad to me that's still not a thing. Like I remember back in the day, dude, on Team Liquid, if someone did those like sales of like, hey, we're going to get like 100 people to buy like a fucking brood war jersey from one of the teams. People would lose their minds, be like, oh my god, I could own like a jacket like Jay Dong. That seemed like the craziest shit. We're not even 10 years later, we still don't have all that. Like, what? What is this shit? It's mad, yeah. isn't it? They're just leaving so, money on the table. It's free money. So I don't know the answer to that because the only answers we've gotten from Riot have not been straight answers, and they've been answers that are ridiculous, like, well, we would have to do it for a hundred teams. It's like you don't, you're just saying that you could just do it for fewer teams. You know, you, you're making that choice. So maybe it's a technical issue, guys, with the engine or with the way that the game is designed or how old the game is. I don't know. Obviously, I think the Valorant system is better, and I hope that potentially it will come sometime in the future to League of Legends. Uh, considering NALCS is watched despite the product when there was a reason to watch. Hold on. It's about to fucking challenge you. Like, okay, hold hold, hold up, hold it. up, hold up, hold up. No, no, no. I'm trying to understand what this question is. It's not phrased very clearly. Um, oh, the, the thrust of this question is, how is LCS viewership ever going to improve slash not just continue to fizzle out? You mentioned the death spiral before in describing LCS, but isn't this just dead at this point, just decaying now? No, it's not dead. It still has viewers. Um, but it's just not going to improve because eventually they're going to run out of tricks to improve the broadcast. The latest tricks they pulled, by the way, were letting Bayano and Cadrill co-stream the league, which, you know, I brought this up on Power Spike, Thorin, but like 
please tell me why Bayano and Cadrill could not co-stream LCS last year. If this is such a genius idea that increases your viewership yeah, year over year by 4%, why did you deny them from doing it last year? If you like the results of this and you are going to publicly say that they are good, then why did you make the fucking dumb decision of kneecapping your viewership last year? You you could have let Cadrill co-stream LCS when he was still an LEC caster. That was, you know, potentially a possibility, right? Um, you could have let Bayano do that and get a bunch of Brazilian fans watching uh, LCS on a co-stream, but you didn't do it. So clearly you don't think this is good is the only conclusion that I can possibly draw from this. And it is only desperation that has, in fact, led you here. And as far as viewership, I think the only way you can improve this viewership is to combine LCS, LLA, and CBLOL into one America's region. That is what I think must be done. But even then, I don't know if it's enough. Because, sure, you would make viewership go up, but I don't know that sponsors are going to pay more money to have more Brazilian fans watching the league. Like That's not a given, guys. Um, you know, North American companies, do you think Pagoda Egg Rolls gives a shit about how many Brazilian fans are watching LCS? No. They're a Schwann's company. They sell frozen food in the United States of America. Uh, do you think AT&T gives a shit? Uh, Red Bull might. You know, there are brands out there that that might care. But I think the the value that you get per Brazilian viewer is far less in terms of sponsorship dollars. So while oh, it gosh. might be it might be a good marketing exercise for Riot and I think would revive interest in in LCS like I think it would be more fun. I think it's the right move to make. I don't know if even that like stops the death spiral, if you know what I mean, Thorne. Because it doesn't solve the fundamental issue which is that the most valuable group of viewers, which are North American viewers are declining. And the only way to get that number up is to play a very long game where you try and get young people in America and Canada interested in playing League of Legends again because they are not right now. They still play it in Europe, still play it by, they still, tons of them still playing it in China and Korea. They don't play it in North America. You need new viewers and you need new players. So you have to have a long-term plan about how you're going to activate that. And I've said this before. The lead producer on League of Legends has said that 2025 is supposed to be a massive year for LOL. I don't know if they're making a new engine. I don't know if it's just a nothing burger, but it's possible that we may see a big revitalization to the core gameplay of League of Legends in order to maybe attract the next generation of players. That would be very exciting. Um, I am engine calling on Joe Biden to create a jobs program <laughs> where the youth of America who will no longer be able to get degrees and get out of student debt and actually get like a job in the market because, I mean, the joke is like they won't be able to fit the quarters eventually. So Androids mm -hmm. will be created using walk AI to do their job for them. In the meantime, they should be paid minimum wage uh, or, be or below like criminals in a federal facility to instead of making like the fucking license plates, they should have to watch LCS because that is hard work that is fucking doing time and at the end of that you're going to be a changed person you'll be free to actually go on with your life and live as a productive member of society you'll be rehabilitated after three years of watching lcs i mean you say that thorin but there were tons of tsm fans that were just in plato's cave allegory for years denying that the yeah. real world of league of legends even existed and saying that those pretty shad lcs shadows on the wall were the best gameplay imaginable and they couldn't just fucking walk outside and watch some korean league of legends so I don't know. I know that. I know that in all of history, I've I've actually I've boiled this down. I've got the the alchemical essence of what tilts you the most in league, and it is that angle. It's when people would say to you, Monty, they'd go, "Oh yeah, you were real critical of that TSM versus Curse Gaming team fight, but if you saw the same game and it had said T one against KT, you'd have said it was fantastic." As though for real, like like forget the idea of being like colorblind to race they're actually acting for real like the gameplay was identical in lcs and lck <laughs> that we were just like pretending the koreans were like that actually is still the maddest corp of all time money it's not like there wasn't a qualitative difference in the team fight that you're watching in lck like, it's so fucking bad <laughs> and then it was it, it was so like bad. it was it was actually just not I possible for a human being who is an expert to tell the difference right just like if, you know if you if you put an nfl so loves that one 
I saw that Dom saw it as well. You know the the fucking quote that came actually it was from my video about Thorn versus Mean comments, where that guy says like, like, why are we saying we can use our eyes to like do the eye <laughs> test and see how good people are? And it's like, bro, you deny like the possibility your eyes can tell you how good a team was. Like, holy fuck! Like, what are you talking about? What is this mad? Philosophy? Yeah, it, it, of course. It, 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 it's like it's like saying <laughs> that you know. Okay, so so we have. You know, we have Chris Collinsworth on an NFL broadcast, and he's going to be unable to tell the difference between an NFL team and a high school team just because the high school team has Dallas Cowboys jerseys on. Like, of of course he can fucking tell the difference. Like, it's not... He spent his whole life playing and analyzing football. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I just thought I was it as well. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, I'm not sure if anything can be done at this point. It's going to have to be a very long, I think the answer is combine, make an America's region, do something drastic with the game itself to ignite interest and then market the ever loving shit out of it to kids in, in America. That's what you can do. That is the, the only thing you can do. Who is more broken, Meta Knight in Smash Brothers Brawl, Michael Vick in Madden 04, or Thorin after being denied the interview of the century with the world-renowned Akali cosplayer, Ablaze Olive? <laughs> oh, is that, are you what is this? I don't even know monkey. what this story is. Tell me the story. Oh, it's, it's actually so pathetic, mate. I forget who he was replying to, but someone on my Discord showed me this. Oh, let me think, actually. Oh, it might have been that guy. Do you remember that Oceanic guy who was that used to be a player on some team back then called Pabu? I think he was the jungle. Oh, yes, the and jungle anyway, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's some guy who, for some reason, every year gets like mad triggered that I exist and make content <laughs> and people don't just like, I don't know, pretend I don't exist because of a tweet I made whenever these people choose in history. So he's one of those people every few years bemoans that I'm still around. And I think this is the person that you should reply to. And the Blaze Olive, the guy who used to be on like Golden Guardians like right, back yeah, in the yeah. day or whatever, who was just like some average ass player in the LC. He was okay, right? basically he just made some mad reply where he said that like because i think someone just so just it was like this monty someone said something like, why do people keep you know going on his shows and a blaze all of basically was like well I'm, i actually said no to his request because he's a dick or something and the reason it's mad is he he was essentially implying a blaze olive turned down a request to do reflections with a blaze olive like <laughs> And that, like, so if people don't get it, at least I'm being sarcastic there, it's like, I even checked, like, because I even thought to myself, Monty, surely someone wouldn't make that on Paul Cloth. Maybe what he's thinking of is maybe, like, three years ago, we invited him to SI or something, and maybe he's referencing that. I checked. I went on the DMs, never DM'd him in my entire life. Never, I think, ever I, I, think I might have. I think I might have actually requested him as a guest to, him, like, the, anyway, GM, the GM of Golden Guardians or something like well, that. Well, the point is, I've never in any context ever contacted this guy. So he just essentially made up a really weird lie that a Blaze Olive, someone who was fast at all, Monty, has never done anything ever in the LCS. I don't think he's even been in a team that's ever even been top four or anything relevant like that. He implied that he turned down a reflection. Like, it's just such a shit lie is the point. Like, it's just so whack, isn't it? Like, mate, I had simple like a month or two ago, you dickhead. I just had like the most legendary players of all time. Like, what are you talking about, you fucking mug? Like, so that's now, like... I, I actually had, didn't have plans, believe it or not, to d interview a Blaze Olive in the Reflection <laughs> series. I know that'll sound crazy to people. What the fuck? I know, it's whacking it. Anyway, the guy just obviously was referencing that story because it's just weird, isn't it? Uh, that's funny. Uh, regarding the COD Activision Blizzard lawsuit in the Four Horsemen episode on it, the issue of copyright ownership leading to monopolies is the same thing plaguing creative content such as music, ebooks, audiobooks. For example, DRM was intended to uh, protect authors from illegal copying of copyrighted works, but now it's weaponized by a company who owns tons of IP to have a chokehold on the market. If you break the DRM from your own written ebook, you are potentially breaking the law. That's true. Uh, what are your thoughts on the current state of copyright intellectual property and potential ways to improve it to have a healthy ecosystem? Um, well, I think I think the issue, I mean, it sucks. Like, it's not made for a digital world. And we started encount encountering some of these issues, like, back in the 90s and stuff with sampling and hip-hop and, like, what is oh. fair use. And, like, there hasn't really been, like, the copyright has not adapted to the digital world of creation like DJs should absolutely be able to sample aggressively and be able to create their own music. And, and certainly they share, you know, they share revenue with the original artists. And I think that's fair, but 
I mean, it gets really crazy because if you guys know, there's a there's a there's a pretty famous DJ named Girl Talk who does basically entirely sampling. So he was kind of the in the in the kind of mid 2000s he was the logical endpoint of like dj shadow who started with introducing which is an amazing album if you've ever heard that and it's just ridiculous now where you get i mean we have issues with this on foreplay uh of movies it's like we are literally just taking 10 second clips of films which by the way i'm sure when we do an episode of foreplay Probably like a thousand people rent or buy that movie who haven't seen it before. I mean, I do it. I go to Amazon and I rent it for three dollars on Amazon Prime or whatever in order to watch the movies that we watch for foreplay. Or if it's a good deal, I'll just buy the movie. I'm like, oh, I know this is a good movie. I'll I'll buy it oh. and I'll watch it again later. So, you know, or they buy a Blu-ray of it or whatever what have you. So in a way, it's weird because we are actually trying to market watching these films and making the films money. Um, and we ourselves are are paying money to watch these films. So I don't really understand. Like, there has to be some sort of change in copyright law that makes this acceptable because digital media can be transformed and we have to have new legal ways to clearly understand the methods in which it can be transformed. And obviously, esports should not be controlled by the publishers. I mean, that like the fact that you can't run your your own event is is crazy. So I think I think that's pretty ridiculous. Uh, how do you reflect on the online presence? Your fan base. Uh, uh, rel- Hold on. There's going to be we'll some stupid ass question. No, no, it's, it's not it's stupid. Go, it's not stupid. Oh, it, it, basically, it's like, how do you reflect on the online presence of your fan base relative to the low standards set by T1 and TSM fans? I wonder if you have a sense of what what a fan base you are nurturing versus what you hope to achieve. I mean, look, I think our fan base is pretty great. You guys, for the most part, are intellectually curious, like pretty chill, down to earth, like enjoy long form content. I, I, I think our fans and you guys have been very supportive. So I like our fan base. <laughs> I don't know if we're intentionally nurturing a fan base. We're just kind of doing what we're interested in. And you guys happen to be interested in the same shit. I don't know if it's so deliberate. <laughs> Maybe that's a mistake on our end. Uh, question for you, Thorin. What do you think about MMA journalist Ariel Helwani? I don't know this guy. Oh, basically, the joke is he actually is just like the slasher of MMA. Like, if you remember when Slasher was at his peak, like he simultaneously was like the main sort of kingpin journalist who knew all the news coming in and all the gossip. But also, he would do stuff like he would provoke certain figures. So you know how like Slasher had that like contentious relationship with Alex Garfield, for example, and he would always be like pushing back and forth, and sometimes he get in trouble, but then sometimes you get the exclusive interview. Basically, Ariel Hawani does that in in um, MMA, and most famously, he's the main. guy guy that's gone up head to head with Dana White of the UFC many, many times and been banned from like access to the UFC and stuff because essentially Dana White does actually, even though the joke is politically, his whole thing's like, hey man, free speech, what can I tell you? Like he himself like senses the fuck out of anyone who says anything negative about the UFC or asks the wrong questions and like, and does all sorts of like shenanigans with the fucking press, which by the way, if people don't know, I'll just point out me and Monty could absolutely have done that with Flashpoint, but we never did do that, which one who was legit press just sign up and they could come as expected. So I do think like this guy actually he is one of the best journalists. The problem I have is like all journalists who get to that level, there's going to be a temptation sometimes to involve yourself in the story or to get into like fucking dramas and beefs yourself because you become, he's become himself like an influencer type figure, even though he doesn't really like play that up. So I'd say like his actual journalism seems pretty good. I do think some of the like more minor dramas are like, Sometimes feels a bit like WWE when they do like the battle, like oh, so it's Dana Vince McMahon is he mate? Like it's a bit, there's a bit of that in there sometimes, you know. Where it's like I imagine on a slow week that you can make the news about yourself if you get involved in drama, basically. But he seems in general like pretty good at what he does. And unlike Sasha, he doesn't just smoke weed and not do any work anymore. He actually, apparently, <laughs> I don't know if he smoke weed, but he does indeed do work. So I, can't that. <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, I don't have. I, we haven't really set the bar high for Sasha. We just do some you know, work, you, you know. You, like, you, <laughs> You know what's crazy, Thorin? Think about this. We might actually be at a point with Slasher where he's been not doing work longer than he did do work. In he's sports. getting there, mate, because people do <laughs> it's forget. Close I think the last year he was going hard was like it was quite a while ago now. It was like what three, four years ago or something. It was, it was fucking a while ago, boys. It was it was yeah. like 2018, I think. It was a long time ago now. <laughs> it was a long time ago. 
And no, tweeting about Dr. Disrespect was not him doing work, guys. Let's be clear about that. That was not work. Him tweeting I mean, someone, is not work. Someone said, some say that was the antithesis of journalism work, being <laughs> as it was a tweet about how he definitely knew something he didn't know and was wrong about and never revealed. So I would say that's actually anti-journalism. In some ways, Monty, you've nailed it. That was actually sort of the zenith point of his career because after that, after creating the anti-journalism equation of I know what Dr. Disrespect said, there was almost, it's like some, it's almost like he had reached the end of actually, fully enough, this would actually would tie into his ethnicity, actually sort of like a fucking, almost he Hebrew mysticism, because if the universe began with a word, he ended it with the final word on journalism, which was just a nonsense speculation from a formerly respected industry figure that just essentially spawned Jake Lucky instantly, like some sort of mad fucking, you know, chaos equation that was fucking wow. war or something. Bringing Kabbalah into this. Interesting. I didn't expect this to go there. I was, I, was, I was working it into a warmer 40k warp related scenario, you know. Um, by the way, guys, the LCS rest of the match between T1 and Firex was just canceled due to DDoS. So they got one game in. Oh, okay, no. Excellent. So we Excellent. did an entire talk show in the time that they were trying to get that game finished. <laughs> yep. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> uh, if you guys got okay, to no. pick your dream team set up for an analyst desk in League or Counter-Strike, who would be on it? Ooh, this could be interesting for League, man. Who would we put on the desk? Analyst desk, remember, not casting, analysts. So, ooh. Because I'll tell you what, I've got an immediate one that people probably aren't going to go with me. I'm going to go old school for my first pull. I would definitely put Deficio on there, mate. I always yeah, I was a massive great. fan of his. I always, I always thought he was great in all environments as well. Just loved him, yeah. Great, can do banter too. Yeah, Fun yeah, guy. he can do the do the banter. Um, I, I actually, for my experience on desks, like, I liked QuickShot hosting the most for me. Okay. okay, because Quickshot actually is an instigator and has kind of an impish sense of humor, and he likes to have okay. he like triggers his analysts very intentionally to like go after each other, and I thought that was really fun. So like I actually really liked it when Quickshot hosted desks uh, for my style. Um, so I, I mean I would want to be on it. I I actually really like Yamato. I like working with Yamato Cannon a lot on desks too. So like Deficio and Yamato would be really fun with me. I think to be on a desk. Thing is, I would just, I wouldn't even try and be like coy. I would just go all bangers. I'd do like Deficio, maybe do, I'd probably have to pick one of the two, but either Papa Smith or Jat. Can't really go wrong with either of those yeah. ones. Notice these are also people who would be mega even on like a world's final. For the host, I think you can go a million ways on that one. You can have Shots, oh, yeah. you can have Dash. There's a whole bunch yeah, of they're all good. Yeah, you can do a lot for that one. Uh, what about Counter Strike? For Counter-Strike, I would just go similarly. I would just pick the absolute best people. Because believe it or not, one of the weirdest things about Counter-Strike, a lot of modern fans won't understand is because of things like all the industry politics and then things like if everyone charges their day rate, then they don't always want to pay like all the people on the desk the full day rate. So you just like, what you do is you pay most people their day a little bit and then we you take one last spot, you just give it to someone like half the day, but the fan holders, that's why usually it's not always like the absolute best people on all the events, essentially. So actually, the, the desk, the joke is, the Dream Analyst desk was never, ever actually done in Counter-Strike. Are you ready? It would be host, you can pick whoever you want. You could have Richard, you could have all sorts of people for the host machine, machine. classic ones, yeah. right? But the actual analysts, these three analysts, as far as I know, I don't think ever did an event altogether. Me... If you don't know, by the way, I did the most majors. I did like 70 plus events. I did A League. Yanko, who obviously after me was like the most famous one who came along and was like doing the real like specialist games. And then Sponge before I became a commentator. That, those three, I think, are baggers. Like you can put other people in there. Maniac's really good now. He's probably come on strong the last few years. Maui's obviously very good. But those three, mm -hmm. me, Yanko, and Sponge would have been an insane fucking desk. Like if that could have done a major, we would have killed it in like 2018 or 2019 or something. Would have been banging. Yeah. That'd be my desk. What roster of players do you be, do you consider to be the most professional in and out of the game? A league that's going to be hard because here's the thing: I would have to imagine it's probably someone like T One, right? It's probably good some Korean team if they're going to yeah. be professional, right? I mean, T One. I, I think it's hard to argue against T One just because of their performance and also the way that they handle themselves in terms of PR and everything. Seems like it's a step above most other teams. I'm not sure there is a better answer to that. It's definitely going to be like a Korean team. <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely going to be a Korean team. 
The problem uh, with it, that is in someone like Counter Strike, I'd know the behind the scenes stories, but in League, we, we, we can only infer things from, like documentaries and stuff, can't we? So it's hard sure. to know for that one. Uh, if DRX and Bro were dropped into the LCS right now, would you pick either to win the LCS? No. Ooh. Well, we, I don't know about win, but they could go deep, put it out there. They could, put it this way, they could make people look four. silly. I mean, you know, make look, people look silly. We're 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 in a world where like Cloud Nine collapsed and FlyQuest Here's bot lane like loses the games for them. The, I'm gonna actually reverse engineer an LS type scandal scenario. So here's the question for you, Monty: If DRX played Cloud Nine in a best of three LCK style, could DRX win? I mean, they could. They could. I mean, you know, Teddy's on that team. Like, they definitely have some very veteran players. It's not outrageous. It's not outrageous. What a world. Here, uh, let me make a different argument. I, you pick those teams. I think Kwangdong would win LCS. I think, Ooh, okay. I think Nongshim would make finals. I think Nongshim is like... I think Nongshim is actually like pretty underrated. DRX, DRX, I think would would do pretty well. I don't know if they would win, but uh, there are some like LCS is very entertaining right now, guys, and I like watching LCS at the moment. But it, it there, there, each team is flawed. Let's put it that way. Each team is flawed, so I don't think it's it's crazy to believe that those teams would be capable of making some deep runs. So basically what we're saying, guys, is if you actually want to make League of Legends really bang and have a sick storyline, make it so that when you get relegated from LCK, you get dropped into LCS. That's just logically. That's right. it's, just, it, well, it, it's like what NLB used to be back in the day. You know, once exactly. you get once you end uh, end your run in LCK, you just get shipped over to America for a while, placed uh, pay, placed deep into the bracket. And then we just see what happens. I would love that. That'd be very entertaining. And then all the interviews when you come home, you're like, yeah, we promise to increase our performance level next year so we don't get punished by being set to <laughs> play the Americans where our form level drops even further, our morale and will to live, you know, <laughs> so when we come back, like, I'll never, they're going to be like Neil McCauley at the end of Heat Monty. They're going to be like, I'm never going back. I ain't ever going back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pays and Delight developed great synergy last year while Pays and Lehens are struggling. He was the MVP, but you guys suggested Delight was the better player. Uh, I mean, Delight was the better player. Uh, was it a mistake to not keep Delight in the super team, or does Gen G needs Lehens shot calling now without Peanut? I do think Lehens offers more to shot calling, and I also think probably Delight wanted more money than Gen G was able to provide him because. Um, you know, Arnold has been very forthright and basically said, like, I had a salary cap to not bankrupt this team and the players themselves fit them fit themselves into this team because they wanted to play together. So I think that it was not possible to get a better team than Genji had with the budget that they had and that those players specifically made sacrifices to all get on that roster together. And this is the team they ended up with. And it's a pretty fucking good team. So. Are we that upset? Get... No, here's the problem with this angle, Monty. This is where people are just looking one for one as a support. It's a bit like the whole angle that's just happened in LEC. So, you know, in LEC, Kaiser got taken out for Rex and they've brought in Trimby, right? And even though people would have asked for that at the beginning of the split, the problem was Kaiser are actually one of the better Rex players. So people feel like it's unfair. But what you've got to look at there is not who is better at support now. You have to ask, what do they bring to the team? Because from these roles, especially like jungle and support, you're bringing intangibles too. So you have to ask things, not like the obvious example is there were past years in LEC teams where I would have been wrong I would have been like just put self made in there because he has like bonkers mechanics but maybe like you needed someone who had like shot calling or could like fucking cover people's lanes or something like he doesn't do right so what I would say on this one that people are missing is if you kick peanut you can't then just have a really good support you now need some sort of shot yep. calling because like obviously when you bring in Canyon that isn't Canyon's game guys he's not like the brain jungle like, he obviously has fucking sick hands doesn't he like he's insanely mechanically talented so to me you have to make up in the lineup somewhere for some sort of shot calling. And also, like, you've already got Chovy. So, like, if you just have a good shot caller, you're pretty much guaranteed to, like, win, like, 80% right. of games at that point in time, just piloting him around the map. Yeah, and what Arnold has to told me is that Chovy and Lehens are doing most of the shot calling, and they were Makes teammates sense. They were teammates previously, guys. Like, yes. they already have synergy. Yes. So, I, you know, I think this is a pretty good situation for Gen G, but I do acknowledge that Pays and Lehens' laning has not been in great. 
has not been great. Um, so, but I mean, when Delight goes with Peanut and Doran to Hanwha Life, then you still get the Peanut shot calling and Delight can still do Delight things. So it feels like this is probably the best of both worlds. Now, I think we're, again, like we said earlier in the episode, where this gets really interesting is if Hanwha had a better mid laner. Because then all of a sudden we have like a really epic matchup between these two teams. In recent episodes of SI and Banter Give and Go, you both discussed teams and players over the ages. How do you compare the legacies of players and teams when both traditional and esports change so much? And how do you compare players of different positions? Well, I think you just have to keep in mind like the era of the game and then the way you evaluated them at the time. That's why living through these eras or doing a lot of research is very important. This is why I go crazy on like the faker fans who try and portray fakers history and present uh, differently than they were, because as somebody, I mean, virtually nobody is qualified to tell me who faker was as a rookie. I literally cast every single game that he played in his first like three years of competition guys. Like I know who faker was. I know what his strengths were. I know what his style was. Um, and so now with that perspective, like it's, it's a lot easier to make those comparisons because I can say things like, well, look at the way he was dominating. Look at the way he was, you know, winning the game all by himself. And it actually, he caused the game to be changed. This is why Deathfire Grass was removed from the game as an item. And so we have to consider like the carry potential of him as an individual when he burst onto the scene was much greater than it is right now. Because Riot intentionally took power away from individual play. And this has been true of a lot of sports. Like with the NFL, they have been iteratively making the game more offensive focused ever since the game began. If you guys know how the awesome. game was played in the early parts of the 20th century, it was all running it was all running yeah. like the old leather Jim helmet Brown era. Was MVP every time, like, he was just fucking a base, just running through everyone. Yeah, like like the passing game took decades to develop, guys. And then it's even if you the old wide receiver stats, guys, they're like so you'll think like the, the position didn't exist. They barely ever yeah. get catches. It's insane. And, and and like that's why you even when the passing game did evolve, and we're talking like the late eighties, early nineties, that's why Jerry Rice's statistics are still so bonkers. Cause oh, he played insane. in a he yeah. played in a time where it was much harder to get those kind of statistics as a wide receiver than it was today. Yes. Um yes. I mean all you have to you could even go back twenty five years. Like look at the late nineties. Look at the early late nineties, late nineties and early two thousands, and look how defense is played. Like you literally cannot make those hits now. You cannot just no, destroy no. somebody going over the middle. I mean, someone like fucking Ronnie Lott would just be kicked out of the game in game <laughs> one of the season. Like you're not allowed to do that, of course. Yeah, these guys are doing insane hits on people. You know, yeah, because because like I've been a Broncos fan my whole life, so I remember watching Steve Atwater play, who is the star of safety course. of the Broncos, and just watching him light motherfuckers up in the middle yeah. of the field in a way that would be. He would get tossed out of the game, like you say, Thorne. So I think I mean, my favorite just... was fucking Brian Dawkins. That oh, guy, yeah, Brian was Dawkins, holy shit, savage! <laughs> like, like, it's no wonder he had like the Wolverine meme. That guy was an actual savage man. I bet everyone was scared <laughs> to shit to play that guy. He just killed you on the field, didn't he? he just came through you. Which uh, you know did make late '90s sports really fun. Coincidentally, oh, this shit. was this was the same era when the Enforcer era of the NHL was going on in the late '90s, early yep. 2000s. Which, by the way, I don't care what anybody says, was the best. Oh, it was hockey period best. ever. Yeah. It was so fucking good in the late 90s, guys. Um, and look, I understand why they changed these things. It It is ridiculously dangerous and terrible for human beings. And what they care more about is that it's terrible for their PR. Um, but, you know, the, it, we, these are the things you have to... So you have to understand, I think, the history of the game in order to make these comparisons, which is why even if you see outrageous receiver stats you still realize that Jerry Rice is fucking amazing because of the era in which he played the game and the rules and like the, the difficulty that he faced in, in achieving those statistics. Here's the thing that's going to really blow your mind guys, because what you're going to realize as I explain this is my approach to how I view different eras and people in history can be applied within the same era to different players and how their scenarios disappear. So what you do is this, you look at what does the player have in terms of tools that he can use. So for example, how good are his teammates? How good is his general manager? What position does he play? Does that position as Monty says, do the rules like inhibit it? Do they enhance it? Is it the scenario? 
scenario that like in this particular era, people don't know how to play against that. You look at what they have that they could basically, what what's that, I, what I tried to ask is this, I actually think it's a really interesting thing you can do, by the way, if you ever want to do like a GOAT discussion, but not make it about rings, but make, but still include things like team accomplishments. Here's what you do. You ask yourself in this person's career, let's say they played 15 years in the NBA or the NFL or something. You ask yourself, how many years did they actually have a team capable of winning the Super Bowl, the NBA? And then you do things like you look in those years, how did they play? And what you do, you'll find out that there are certain people who essentially like never, ever could have been in a GOAT discussion because maybe they only had like three years in their whole career, like a Dan Marino type guy, where they ever could have ever won. Like they just didn't even have the pieces to win. Like I don't think you can judge that person uh, according to the people who had the opposite. Like if people don't know, people like Joe Montana and Tom Brady in the NFL had almost the most chances to win of anyone ever because they had insane defenses and fabulous GMs and, and insane fucking coaching their whole career and kickers that are, you know, like they had everything essentially. And so if you ever go and look, I think you have to look at those things as well as I always say the eye test is God. You've got to watch the match as well. Like you got to, like the problem is in the modern day, you can get like a pointer to me. I always say stats are like a signpost. They may be like, tell you like over here, there's something interesting, but you have to still go and watch the game to figure out why it's interesting. Like you're still going to have to actually watch a match to know if Michael Jordan is better than LeBron. Like no stats page could ever tell you. There's no advanced stat can ever tell you. Cause the problem is when you actually watch the guy play, you're going to see him do stuff that like, like the joke is Michael Jordan do like the best move ever. It's still two points isn't it like still two points on the board but on the on the box score it can't tell you like he did like a 360 fucking through the legs like it can't tell you that you have to actually watch that to see it so I think like a bit of intuitive stuff by watching experience helps like Monty's saying in that sense but then I also think you've got to actually be like you're saying if you want to actually have an authoritative opinion a definitive opinion about like historical so you've got to be a history of you've got to be a student of the game you've got to be a historian where like you say you're not even just looking up who, who like was the team good you're looking up things like oh right like I'll give you an obvious example if you're an NFL fan Fan, and you're a modern day guy. Say you what? Say you started in the last five to six years. Here's the first thing you need to look up before you can have any discussion about quarterbacks. You have to look up how the defensive rules were different in the past, like Monty says, for covering the middle of the field. Because what you'll immediately realize the second you look into this topic is, oh wait, so you mean all those old tight ends weren't morons? You just couldn't do what like <laughs> Gronkowski and fucking Kelsey did for like their whole careers. You can't just run over just the middle die. and get an easy shot. Pass. <laughs> yeah, the, the point is really it was all Brian Dawkins. Like, we just said, we'll take your head off your shoulders. Like, you'd be dead, essentially, is the joke. Like, so if you if you look at that, you're immediately going to get, like, a different sense of, like, what the Chiefs are doing. Like, the point is, Dan Marino couldn't do that in the 80s. His Titan would be dead if he tried to do what... Patrick Mahomes does so that'll immediately start to give you some of these like differences which I, by the way it is like a fascinating topic like essentially the reason we do shows like this is it's like the, it's a subject of a lifetime you can these rabbit holes well, never end when you start investigating I mean, them do they that, that's like one of my major tilters in the modern NFL is because I have to watch Patrick Mahomes get like gently lifted up like a baby and then oh, placed mad, onto it? the ground at the end of a 15 yard yep. run that he is refusing to slide for because he'll yep. know, he knows he's going to get three extra yards because nobody's going to blow them the fuck up. Oh, wait. This particular Super Bowl might have been the most egregious version of that because you're right. Some of those runs, they were almost looking at him like, bro, if you don't want us to hit us, you're supposed to go down now. And he was just abusing it to get like 10 extra yards he every time, that. wasn't he? It was gross. Yeah. But, but it's a Super Bowl, bro. They're <laughs> supposed to kill you in the Super Bowl. Like, that's, I, I, I'm so just saying, get back there again. 20 years ago, guys, if you tried no. that shit as a quarterback, you would just get destroyed. <laughs> I mean, Fred Werner would actually be allowed to like legally kill Patrick Holmes in the 80s. Like, he'd just be dead, wouldn't he? Like, instantly, like, just be dead on the floor. Just crumpled mess. Because that, no, I agree. That's so egregious, that one, in it? It's so fucking bad. Yeah. Well, who can argue? They keep hitting new viewership peaks, Thor, and like every year the NFL is like 99 out of 100 of the most TV watched TV broadcasts in America. They it is actually impossible basically for the NFL to do better than it is right now. So they must be doing something right. <laughs> yes. Um in my home country, everybody played CS at the beginning of the 2000s. We went through 1.3, 1.4, and 1.5 quickly. However, once 1.6 came out, we had a huge community split, and most of the servers and players remained on 1.5 for a few years after 1.6 came out. Because oh, 1. Country, 6 is this was... going to be like India or something? Come on, <laughs> Just like, I don't know. Was there such a separation country, in the pro scene about. back in the day, or did everybody embrace 1.6 with open arms? 100%. 100% of, there was no split at all. There was, everyone just went to the latest version every time. There you go. 
That's why it makes me wonder what fucking countries he's talking about with. Because like, he's making it sound, Monty, like there's a bunch of people still to this day on a 1.5 server, like the land that before time, like that was lost by history. And if I go there, it's like seeing some Neolithic civilization. Like, what the hell? You guys in Volpe? Like, it's just, there's no way. What country is this guy talking about? It's, this sounds bad, <laughs> sauce. <laughs> All right, what are some of the examples, best examples of well-executed breaking of the fourth wall in TV, movies, or games? Um, I can give you some in games. I mean, I can give you some in, in most of these genres. So breaking of the fourth wall. Um, this would be like acknowledging that the audience is watching you guys or addressing the audience directly. So I'll tell you the obvious one, Monty, because we're obviously fans of them. All those point and click LucasArts adventures, like oh, fucking of Monkey Island or oh, Day yeah. of the Tentacles. Day of the Tentacles. They all have fucking nods great. like that and little, yeah, little memes like that course. Probably the most famous one in gaming is from Metal Gear Solid 1 in the Psycho Mantis fight where you had oh, to sure. like, you know, switch your the controller. Or whatever. Yeah, you had to switch your controller. Thing, uh, you know, to the other port. Um, some more recent games, like the Stanley Parable, is very famous for uh, breaking the fourth wall. Um, Undertale, very famous. That's a more recent game. Um, in terms of TV shows, like, it, you know, Shakespeare, obviously famous for soliloquies and stuff in terms of theater, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from, which is where you get House of Cards, right, with uh, Kevin Spacey breaking the oh, fourth wall and talking ones, to, the, yeah, to the camera. I don't. I think House of Cards is trash. Like, but. He got so used to doing it. He started just doing it on YouTube when he wasn't even hired to do the show anymore. It's like, Kevin, Kevin it's over. Just well, let it go, bro. He, he did start, like, as a Shakespearean actor, right? He played Richard III in some film version. Richard III is the character, like, him and Hamlet are the ones who are most famous for having the the, the soliloquies directly to the audience. Uh, and so, you know, he brought that into the the Frank Underwood character in House of Cards. Um, what about movies? I'm trying to think of some movies that break the fourth wall. I mean, there's tons of them, guys. Like, but I just Googled some. There are some classic, like, obviously, Fight Club. Oh, yeah, for sure. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people don't know, by the way, the actual, a lot of people haven't read the book of Fight The book Fight Club, basically, like, obviously it doesn't contain like, the action sequences, it's a fucking book. But, like, what it basically is, is it is just loads of excuses to do those little, like, rants about, like, pop culture stuff, like, this thing is like this or whatever. Like, it's just, like, a lot of funny little witty things like that. So there's a million in TV and movies, though. There's no point even going through those. There's a bazillion. There's a bazillion. And by the way, I'll give you an obvious one, Monty. Here's someone who does it in almost every fucking movie. How about Woody Allen? His oh, entire yeah. style is basically yeah, like yeah. <laughs> turn to the camera, sort of like, hey, what are you, what, what, what's going on here? Or whatever. Yeah, we all get it. We get it. I mean, most recently, the one that I can think of is like the Deadpool films, because he does that in comics too. The Deadpool oh, characters, you know, breaks the, the yes. fourth wall in the comic as well. Yeah. Um, all right, here we go. As the discussion about formats arises with MSI approaching, Concerns inevitably resurface given Riot's past missteps. Despite this, MSI is a double elimination format again this year. Yes, we like that. You have a significant challenge persisting within the structure of tournaments featuring MOBA-style games. How can we ensure that the upper bracket teams enjoy a fair advantage in the grand finals? Of, He's doing this to tell you money. It's not real. Wait, wait check. <laughs> check. Check. The, what's the name of the account? What's the name of the account? Is it a name we know? Mr. Hyde. It? No, it's, uh, it's not. Oh, okay. Oh, no, 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 it's real. It's actually legit. <laughs> Here's, you've actually hit Monty's second biggest tilt to which is, but what about the bracket re But what about a bracket reset, Monty? Bracket reset. Reset. <laughs> this is my no biggest, biggest tilt. Uh, they, they do offer a proposed solution. Come on, hit me with it. Come on. The Bye, grand guys. finals would be a best of five slash seven series for the upper bracket team. So the w the winner's bracket team, the format entails a best of five where they need to secure three wins out of the first five games to claim the championship, which is just winning a best of five. Okay. Just, I'm so scared this is going to be extended series from MLG, but just hit me with it, Monty. Hit me with it. Come on. Should it, they find on. themselves trailing 0 3 1 3 or 2 3, the tournament transition into the championship game? So basically, oh, if they God, lose. It's extended series. He's recreated MLG. <laughs> extended series one of the original live on three type drama. Everyone 
won't hit it. Oh, God. What's he's done God? it. What he's reinvented the wheel, Thorin. He, he has. Except he's invented a fucked up wheel that works worse than a wheel. That's so bad. So if you don't know, guys, this was literally done in StarCraft in the West in like the tw early 2010s. And yeah, the problem yeah. with it is this. Like you're saying there, it does sound on paper like it makes sense, right? It sounds fairer. But I'm telling you, it just makes way worse matches. It just does, unfortunately. Like, it sort of ruins the tournament. Especially because, like, I mean, you, you just have to see it played out. It wasn't good. I, unfortunately, I know what he means, but even though I get why, look, mate, I'm autistic. I like everything to follow, like, a set rule and never deviate. But, like, in this particular case, just a mixture of, like, compromise, time, how about what makes for an interesting game. It, it's just better for the final if there isn't an advantage. It's better yeah, if it's so, just so a straight-up match, I'm afraid. Yeah, basically... He says, like, it transitions into championship games where they must secure victory by a margin of at least one game. So the winner's bracket team would basically have a chance to win, like, four games in a row from an 0-3, three, three games in a row from a 1-3, or two games in a row from a 2-3 to win the title. Whereas the lower bracket team faces a best of seven, so they have to win four games. So if they win a game after winning winning the best of five at any point okay. in time. So basically, it's just like you have to like reverse sweep your way out of that situation. So the, the real problem with this, guys, okay. is just too, it's just too long. Like we, we can't fucking play seven games of League of Legends in a day. Like the players cannot play that. I'm sorry. Like, have you seen a long best of five? That can last six hours in League of Legends. We have to play these events. The MSI Finals is going to be in a stadium. You can't keep an audience in a stadium for eight hours, however fucking long this would take this game to play. Like, haven't didn't we learn that from cricket that you can't make sports this way, guys? Like, no. It can't just go on forever and ever and ever. Um, and I think the quality of play would just deteriorate massively after five games anyway. Um, well, best of seven sounds like absolute ass in League of Legends. Maybe. Yeah, Way it, it sounds much. horrible. Uh, you, I, I feel I, at the end of a best of five, Thorin, I, I don't think I felt in League of Legends often that the wrong team won. Like, oh, it does no. happen occasionally, but most of the time I feel pretty satisfied with the result. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's actually it's one of the few areas that league's nailed. I think the best of five just is definitively the best format. Yes. So, and, and as for advantages, there already are advantages. I mean, we like first off, you get side selection. There is an advantage. You get to play the side you want for the majority of the series, right? Um, and also, you just play fewer games. I, I I don't really think you guys understand how big of a deal league, not especially playing a additional series is. Yeah. That's massive. It's huge. With Astralis's loss to Heroic before finally being eliminated from the Major after the controversial Stown and Yabi move, I'm curious if there are any examples you can think of where something similar happened in League or CS where the team that seemingly gets screwed over by a roster move comes out on top. Oh, it'll have happened loads of times. Like, let me think of some... Um... I mean, the problem is I'm trying to think of one where it's like actually like that. Like, surely it has to be like a, a Niski. It has to be like Niski leaving Fnatic, right? <laughs> yeah, it could be right. That's not a bad one. Essentially, someone who were like got kicked out, and then they ended up being better in the team they were kicked out into than the one they'd come from. That right. must happen loads of times. M Mickey X. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, remember, like they were actually fucking. Yeah, they were they were mega. Who else? Oh, an obvious one would be um what about what I mean here's I've got I've got one for you. Well, obviously Reckless fucked over Fnatic when he went to G2, didn't he? Because he told him in the offseason, like, ah, oh, stay, and then he chose not to. Went and made the super team instead of cap. And then the joke is by the summer, it was fucking Fnatic that was in the final again, and they went to Worlds. Yeah, like G2 true. didn't even go to make a final like you. So that's gotta be one right there. There's one. There you go. All right, there's there's a few for you. Do you think there is a chance since it would benefit them that the Saudis are helping the optics versus the optic versus blizzard what i don't oh, understand he the means question. like basically he means does he think that the saudis will help optic in the lawsuit against blizzard like Scump oh. and Hex? because it would because if you bro if you sort of jail broke the circuit then they could just take over everything in esports is the because they're not but like that's not a bad idea like put it this way if someone's out there hit me up i can give you a few tips because yeah you could absolutely just take over so, to do with that, couldn't you? so the problem with them doing that is like 
if it was ever discovered that they were actively bankrolling something like that, the publishers would refuse to partner with ESL and have them run their events, right? Because they would be in a conflict of interest when they are a when like with their own clients, like you, you, you know what I mean. Me just like really quickly turn your camera on and off for me because on mine it's like gone really. Oh good. no, you're all, you're already like fixed. Anymore. It's already fixed. It's already fixed. no, no for you. It's you for you for me. Look really bad on the screen right now. Like I can't see you basically. It's all like image. Oh like, oh, oh, oh yeah, no terrible. problem. No problem. Do it really quickly. <laughs> do it really quickly. Yeah, no problem. There we go. There we go. Problem solved. That was just like, right, that cool. was doing my head in so much. Yeah, so. no worries. Um, anyway, uh, it would be a conflict of interest with their own clients who are publishers and like. Sure. I'm pretty sure there would probably be some legal recourse that the publishers would actually have against them, because at that point they would be actively like acting in their own clients' worst interests. So I don't think they're going to I think they would celebrate this happening, but I don't think they're going to take an active role in this lawsuit. What are your thoughts on modern art? <laughs> I can't. I would just take the Gandhi joke and paraphrase it and say, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> there you go. There, there's, there, there's a line um, from the sitcom 30 Rock where Alec Baldwin's character is looking at modern art and just exclaims, this is not art. We know what art is. It's pictures of horses and ships. And I tend to feel the same way. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of modern visual art uh, i'm sure you guys heard the rumors from the past that t1 was exploring the option allegedly of moving their lull team to na if they were allowed if they were to happen if that were to happen do you think riot would not be hypocritical and make them drop three of the five players as to have the two allotted import slots it's not going to happen guys t1's not going to move their team to na that sounds and like the worst idea of all time by the way i think that they may have explored that option because of the, you know, Comcast having the Valorant team in the early days, like T1's Valorant team, um, and okay. wanting to operate out of North America. But I think they would have to comply with the, the roster rules of the league. So. What time of day are you most productive or is your productivity not really bound to a time of the day? Um, I prefer to actually work in the morning. Um I actually don't really like working in the evenings, which is when I do this show now. So I think morning, like morning to early afternoon is generally when I'm most productive. What about you? Yeah, I've found that I actually like to do most of my work within the first, like, let's say, like seven to eight hours of being awake. I yeah. actually also find like it's to me, I almost think of it like a power bar in a video game and I use up the energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find if I if I have to go till the end of the day, those are the ones where sometimes you just have nothing in the tank. So I don't I don't like to do stuff at the end. I also just don't like working when it's dark out very much. I find it difficult. Um well, one like of the problems some... I have is I I can't like immediately just fucking go to sleep when I finish doing work. It takes time to like wind down afterwards. So I also need a few hours to do that process. That's why actually, if people don't know, it's not just political stuff in esports. I also would not want to do as many LAN events anyway. Like even if I had every event in the world and CS yeah. offering me, I wouldn't do as many. I would do like one every month max, like because the travel and like the shit sleep sleep schedule. So I need like a few hours after I finish work to just fucking just make it all go away and then just. <laughs> Go to sleep with a little cradle. <laughs> no, I don't really do that part. But I do need to wind down though. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, to Monty, with your time in Ireland, um, did you have a chance to play or watch hurling or GAA, which is Gaelic football, guys? How did you find them compared to sports back in the States? I think fucking hurling is awesome. I think hurling is a fucking sick sport. Uh, really... What's hilarious is if someone's like a boomer from the 90s, that sounds like you're talking about throwing up in yeah. American <laughs> slang. But he means like this, like this fucking spot where you like throw like a fucking, what do you, what do you actually chew, so, throw? So you, there's a ball called a Schlitter. Uh, and it's kind of like field hockey guys, um, but really much more impressively athletic. So what you do is you have like a field hockey stick and the, the Schlitter is the ball and you run down the field while like bouncing this ball at the end of the stick. So it's kind of like lacrosse. So I played lacrosse in high school. It's kind of like lacrosse, but without a net. 
And so you bounce it and you can like hit it along the ground and you can also like hit it up into the air and swing it like a baseball bat in order to to uh, score goals. It is a very cool sport. It is really, really fun to watch. Um, so I, I was a big fan of hurling. I think hurling is great. <laughs> I also think Gaelic football is better than normal football. So I, I was I, I was I had fun watching that and rugby too. Like I enjoyed watching like the the Six Nations Cup and everything when I was in Ireland. I will say the one thing that I do find mad is considering Americans complain about like football. So just watch rugby, you fucking idiots. Like you would, it was so easy to get into. You'd be able yeah, to enjoy it like, literally the first time you watch it. It's very easy to enjoy. Yeah. It's actually like an underrated sport to be fair. Yeah. I think all the Irish sports are really cool. Uh, are there any NBA players or storylines that mirror those in the Lee sports? For example, I feel like Adam is the Ben Simmons of LEC. Both have teams tailored to fit with their exceptional yet very limited skill sets, treating them as superstars. However, rather than developing their game, they've just coasted. Um, do you have any, I, I'm not an NBA fan, so I'm not going to be able to make these. Analogies. Basically the person he's talking about, Ben Simmons used to be like a really good, like point guard, but he was famously like, he had a really shit jump shot and it didn't look like he worked on it for a lot of seasons. And so he took a lot of criticism. The problem with that one is I actually don't think that applies to Adam anymore. Like I do think in past years, he was the player they're describing. Like he was a bit one dimensional. You had to make everything work around him. I think this year's actually sure he could just be really good. Like he actually, like, like if you saw Rich's wrath, when we did like on the sides, like we did our own all pro, I picked him as my best top player and I actually did think he was the best top player overall he looked yes he had the resources but he did carry when he had them and, and unlike the last years he isn't only playing the gods champions yeah, guys. yeah, like, he, yeah. Also he looks better on the normal the champions he can, can play rumble now too. kind of yeah <laughs> yeah like, like people like oversold that part like he has actually improved the problem is look mm. I just like him as a person get, don't get me wrong he's a dickhead but <laughs> as a player he has gotten better year on year you've got to give him got to give people their credit are, are there any like job. NBA to lol analogies you would make uh, what about he says as a jumping off point? He offers some some potential players like Viper or on. Upset or Perks. Like Viper, who's Elo held on fucking NBA teams right now? <laughs> oh yeah, who who the fuck would be on like a one that's? Let me have a look at. Isn't isn't I'll Jokic kind of like Niski in a way? Is that a fair comparison to make? No, because the problem is like your the thing about the Jokic guy is he's basically like one of the most efficient players to ever play basketball, and so he's like just unbelievably good in that sense. Like, like basically, I think he's probably like the I get here's the one area he's a bit like Nisky. He's a good floor raiser. The difference is that he also might actually just be the best player. Like he is really sick. Uh, I mean, I guess people are gonna say something like fucking Luka Doncic is going to be like Viper because they basically just go ham every game, and then like their team probably can't win. You know, so I guess that's not a bad analogy. There we go. Next question. Uh, <laughs> possibly legit or brain rot. The balance team were asked to intentionally overbuff champions to attempt to get LCS viewership up. Nah, not that's fake news. They don't. The balance There's team. No way. Come on, guys. The balance team has esports viewership is such a small part of League of Legends and especially North American esports viewership that they are definitely not given direction directives because the the cost of them doing you know bad game balance is like billions of dollars so you know they're going to take their jobs pretty seriously because maintaining the health of the player base is way more important than like propping up some shitty ass dying North American league when you guys first introduced Liquid IV as a good way to help take care of a hangover, I went out in the Netherlands to try and get some of it myself. It was hard, but I managed to find it. <laughs> Credit to you. And it works super well, as well as being very tasty. Do you guys have any tips to get it in bulk easier in the Netherlands? They just ship it to you, Thor, directly, I know. So, um, Do you have any other recommendations that you guys use against hangovers? No. I think as you get older, there's no way to really... It becomes harder to prevent them. I will say that liquid IV has helped me, especially if I I drink it like before I go to bed uh, or while I'm like at the end of my evening of drinking. And then, you know, also in the morning afterwards, um, obviously other electrolyte supplements can help with that as well. Uh, I don't know the tried and true. Just drink water consistently while you're drinking and you're just going to have a better time. Don't drink on an empty stomach. Don't. Drink a lot when you're jet lagged. That one's fucked me up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. You just get old and then hangovers just last three days. It's horrible. 
can't drink as much so anymore. Basic, first way, this is actually a wider sort of tip for life in general, but essentially the trick becomes after you've already got the hangover, there is no magic bullet. I mean, there, look, there are actually literally like supplements and stuff you can take that will help you and have like, you know, precursors of certain amino acids and brain chemicals to help, you know. You can do that, true, if you go really deep. But essentially, like most things in life, what you learn is, like, I'll, I'll give you the best analogy. It's a sporting analogy. Supposedly, the legendary UCLA basketball coach, John Wooden, used to say something like, like, essentially, like, if you if you if you don't have time to do it right the first time, how are you going to have time to do it over afterwards? Which is an incredibly poignant thing of saying. Like essentially, if you prepare properly, you won't need to fix your problem afterwards, which sometimes takes even more effort than just doing it right. So what I would say is you've got to get ahead of the problem. So as Monty's saying, like the classic thing obviously is drink some water while you're doing it. But obviously, I know people are gonna go like, but I don't feel like water. Have well, then what you do is you find creative solutions. Like, for example, like don't make it water every single one, make it like every three drinks, one's a glass of orange juice, or you do something like you have like a fucking the odd non-alcoholic beer in with the alcoholic one right, if right, you right. just do like if you just do tiny little things like that and then also if you're going out make sure you eat something before you go to bed just small things like this will add up the next day and also by the way in general make sure your calendar's free the next day that you don't have to get up <laughs> and do something like fucking 10 in the morning or something mental give yourself some time to decompress if you if you if you really next level go do a fucking i don't know flotation tank or something or have a yeah. lovely massage or do a sword by the way if you had access to a sword i'd say that's probably the shit oh right there. yeah you go to a sauna, you'll feel amazing <laughs> after that yeah. Yeah, 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 I personally also, I'll tell you an underrated one. I actually think sometimes working out can be quite nice when you're hungover. It kind of makes me sure. feel better afterwards, man. I well, feel you like can I sort of sweat it out. Yeah, you can sweat it out for sure. Like in a sauna or working out, that's good. Yeah. Uh, also, like Koreans, because they drink so much, have special hangover foods. So what? they actually. You know, Monty, I always wondered, by the way, why to this day do we still not have the drinks they have? Like if people don't know, <laughs> that's like notorious that they just drink those little tonic things the next day, don't they? They all drink that shit. Yeah. And and just tastes like licorice, basically, right? Just some weird yeah. tasting root. But shit they they right? literally have you know you can go to many restaurants and get hangover soup in Korea, and oh, what it sure. is is like a very hot, very spicy, like pork soup. Um, sometimes it has sundae, which is like the uh, blood and uh, rice noodle sausage, which I love in there. And eating a bunch of really spicy, super hot soup does because it helps you sweat it out. It does make you yep. feel a lot better. It does make you feel a lot better. I think that's Speaking just great. Of which, when I was in Korea, my favorite hangover food was just Jim Dak, mate. I'd just go oh, and yeah, get yeah, some yeah. of that fucking spicy <laughs> that's so hearty. And when I would drink that like broth, mate, I felt like yeah. I'd make the gods call to himself. Like, it, was amazing. it was amazing. I would feel so good. I yeah, wish I could go get some spicy, right now that I'm talking about it. <laughs> spicy soups are great. Um, Last question for this week, guys, because we got through all the questions. Uh, solely based on narrative, which was the best world championship for LOL? How could it not be DRX winning? Just on narrative. Like, I, I think, like, the faker, it, it was it was almost impossible to... be the first to... faker one, doesn't it? The you you think the first one. faker one, 2013? Because to... Because to me, that's what sets the whole story of Faker is that like he comes that's along fair. over the year, the team gets better, they win the summer, he does the Z1v1, then he goes to Worlds, then they win Worlds. It's like, and then from there, like that's the bar set in league, isn't it? Like that's like the GOAT player. So to, for me, that will always be a special one. I don't know. I think, I think the, the Deft versus Faker 2022 one is just so crazy. Like, oh, you actually meant that for real. The problem is, yeah. I thought you were being sarcastic. No, I just for narrative. Look, just oh, for right, narrative. Ignoring the level of play, right? Okay, we're no, only no, talking about as a just story. for narrative. It's a movie. Just for narrative. Right, if, okay. we're making, if we're making the fucking League of sure. Legends anime, like, I, how could you have scripted oh, no, that any better? Analogy, that is like if you made the movie Cool Runnings, but they win the gold medal at the end, bro. Yes. They don't just like yeah. go there. They actually win the gold at the end. Like that's It's true. That would be a mental movie. I fucking it, love that. I love that movie, by the way. I fucking love Cool Runnings. <laughs> I mean, in it, general, anything with John Candy in was just fire back in yeah. the day. Uh, man, I, Cool Runnings Dead is, I, I watched it. Yeah, sadly, I love John Candy. But I I, uh, I watched that movie again in like the last couple of years. And it is still like, it. yes, it is saccharine. And it is like the, you know, oh, such gosh. a like, feel, you know, it's in that vein of like 90, 80s and 90s, like feel good sports movies. But I fucking love those, a lot of those movies. So I, I think Cool Runnings is great. But yes. <laughs> Uh, I just purely from a narrative perspective, I guess other ones that held up pretty well was was like uh, IG winning. That that narrative was pretty cool. 
If G2 had done well, G2 could have potentially... That would have been the best. Yeah, I think yeah. how sick that would have been. If, have G2, been if, if G2 had just won. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some of them, um, but... There's some pretty good ones. Yeah, we had we had some we had some pretty good narratives. A lot of expected narratives though. Or narratives that weren't even good. Like Samsung beating T1 is like wh- who wanted that one? That that ending sucked. <laughs> the funny thing is though, some of the narratives uh, people just don't know like how deep they are. Like the maddest one to me of, of all time might actually just be FPX winning Monty because if people don't sure. know, if you actually knew the people who followed the LPL, they were talking about Doinby like that years before, guys. Like like for real, when he was back on like Chowgu Reapers or whatever, every year they would always be like this Doinby guy is like just the most insane like captain leader, like he micros everyone on the map. And you'd always think like, well, he's pretty good, but like, you know, they're not like the best. The idea they won worlds off that is fucking insane. Like, I mean, you can see to this day, people like Chris Pantian still play in the top teams. Like, they're still considered among the best players. Like, they've all had a legacy from that. It's crazy. True. True. All right. Well, that was our last question, guys. Uh, thanks. We'll be back next week. Uh, lots of lots of good LPL, LCK, and some LCS to discuss then. We'll see you later.